hey guys what's up yeah as i've told you we are beginning our, our series in my world development and this is the course for everybody uh, whether you're a beginner we are going to begin at that level whether you're an advanced my world developer this you will at least have something for you in this course please just watch until the end don't forget to subscribe please like and tell your friends to subscribe so that we can grow the account thank you yo what's up guys yeah it's uh abram x here um <coughs> so actually um after uh, some time um, uh, in our uh, Mar malware development course i've realized that uh, there is a need to do some uh, programming uh, series okay uh, so that uh, we can use them to understand um, what's uh, what takes place uh, in uh, our coding malware programs okay yeah we need uh, uh we need to be like competent in programming to be good malware developers okay so i've decided to start with c <coughs> i'm going to do c first of all but everything about c uh, in regards to security yeah advanced c programming everything sockets okay then i will do um python and uh, c plus plus okay yeah so uh, let's begin with C programming. Um, yeah, as uh, always, I use uh, my VS Code in uh, Ubuntu. This is my Ubuntu machine. So let's begin C mm, programming. <coughs> Just know that C is uh, one of the oldest, most widely known, and uh, most influential programming language. It's among the most influential programming languages. You get? Um, it's used in uh, many industries because it is a uh, highly flexible and uh, powerful language okay learning c is a worthwhile endeavor no matter your starting point or your aspirations okay because it builds a solid foundation in the skills you will need for the rest of your programming career that's the number one reason you should learn c okay and it helps you understand how a computer works underneath the hood <coughs> so as how it stores and retrieves information and what the internal architecture looks like okay um with that said c can be difficult to learn okay especially for beginners um, because it can be cryptic okay yeah so uh, in this course we are going to aim to teach c programming uh, fundamentals you get yeah and uh, I'm going to do them uh, in regards to a beginning programmer. Okay, you don't need to know anything to begin this journey. All you have to do is to do some hard work. Yeah, and in uh, this uh, uh, <coughs> series, we are going to look at uh, see beginners. Beginners. I'm not talking about everybody about see. Um, we are going to look at first of all the introduction of c we are going to look at uh, variables and data types in c we are going to look at operators in c conditional statements in c loops arrays strings yeah then we shall look at uh, advanced topics like data structures memory memory management pointers to get file management yeah union structures all that we shall look at them don't worry so <coughs> um in uh, this uh, tutorial we are going to learn uh, about uh, the bas basics of uh, c syntax and uh, we familiarize ourselves with uh, the general structure of all c programs okay and uh, by the end of this tutorial you will have set up you will have a basic understanding of what programming is yeah and what c is so what is programming first of all you know computers are not smart you okay? get even though they can process data tirelessly and can perform operations at a very high speed you get <coughs> they cannot think for themselves they need someone to tell them what to do next you okay? get humans tell computers what to do and exactly how to do it by giving them detailed step-by-step -step instructions to follow you get a collection of detailed instructions is known as 
a program. I've said a collection of detailed instructions is known as a program. Programming is the process of writing the collection of instructions that a computer can understand and execute to perform a specific task and solve a particular problem. A programming language is used to write the instructions. You get? And the humans who write the instructions and supply them to the computer are called computer programmers. So, um, once you click to play this video, you've entered the League of Computer Programmers. <laughs> um, there are uh, three types of programming languages. There are uh, three types of programming languages. Low-level languages, high-level languages, and middle-level languages. Low-level languages include a machine language, also known as binary and assembly. However, assembly has many f uh, flavors, you get? <coughs> Both the languages provide little to no abstraction from the computer's hardware. The language instructions are closely related to or correspond directly to specific machine instructions. You get? Um, this closeness to the machine allows for speed, efficiency, less consumption of memory, and fine-grained control over the computer's hardware. Machine language is the lowest level of programming languages. Um, the instructions consist of series of zeros and ones that correspond directly to a particular computer instructions and locations memory. Instructions are also directly executed by the computer's processor. <coughs> Even though um, machine language was the language of choice for writing programs in the early days of computing, it is not a human-readable language and it's time-consuming to write. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, assembly language allows the programmer to work closely with the machine on a slightly higher level. It uses mnemonics and symbols that correspond directly to a particular machine's instruction set instead of using sequences of zeros and ones. H higher levels higher level programming languages like C, C++, Java, Python, JavaScript, Ruby, PHP, mm, yeah, are far removed from the instruction set of a particular machine architecture. Their syntax resembles the English language, making them easier to work with and understand. Uh, programs written in high-level languages are also portable and machine-independent. That is, a program can run on any system that supports that language. Okay? Uh, with that said, they tend to be slower, consume more memory, and make it harder to work with low-level hardware and systems because of how abstract they are. Yeah, I said higher-level higher level programming languages, you get like Python, JavaScript, and others, you get? Then we have middle-level programming languages, C and C++, okay? And they act as a bridge between low-level and higher-level uh, programming languages. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I made a mistake in higher-level languages. Yeah, middle-level, we have C and C++, and uh, they make a bridge between higher level and low level languages. They allow for the closeness and a level of control over computer hardware, okay? At the same time, they also offer a high a level of abstraction with instructions that are more human readable and understandable for programmers to write. <coughs> so, <coughs> since this is a a course about C, pro C programming language. What is the C programming language? C is a general purpose and procedural programming language. A procedural programming language is a type of programming language that follows a step-by-step -step approach to solving a problem. It uses a series of instructions 
also known as procedures or functions that are executed in a specific order to perform tasks and accomplish goals. These instructions tell the computer step by step what to do and in what order. So, C programs are divided into smaller, comma, more specific instructions that accomplish a certain task and get executed sequentially one after another following a top down approach okay um this promotes code readability and maintainability so let's look at a brief history of the c programming language c initially was developed in the early 70s by dennis ritchie at a t and t bell laboratories okay the development of C was closely tied to the development of the Unix operating system at Bell Labs. Historically, operating systems were typically written in an assembly language and without portability in mind. During the development of Unix, there was a need for a more efficient and portable programming language for writing operating systems. Okay? Um, Dennis Ritchie went on to create a language called B, which was an evolution for an earlier language called BCPL, Best Combined Programming Language. It aimed to bridge the gap between the low level. I've said it aimed to bridge the gap between the low level capabilities of assembly and the high level and the high level languages used at the time, such as Fortran. You get B was not powerful enough to support the Unix environment. So Richie developed a new language that took instructions from B and BCPL and had some additional features. He named this language C. That's how C was born. C. Yeah, that is C. So, C's simple design, speed, efficiency, performance, and close relationship with the computer's hardware made it an attractive choice for system programmers okay? and this led to the unix operating system being rewritten in c c language has some characteristics and use cases um despite c being a relatively old language compared to other modern programming languages of in use today it has stood the test of time and still remains popular according to <coughs> some website which measures the popularity popularity of programming languages each month C is the second most popular programming language you get as of last year as of uh, November last year this is because C is considered the mother of programming languages and is one of the most fundamental uh, language of computer science um, most modern and popular languages used today either use c under the hood or are inspired by it for example python is default implementation and interpreter c python is written in c and languages such as c plus plus c hash are extension of c and provide additional form uh, functionality you get even though c was originally designed with system programming in mind it is widely used in <coughs> many many other areas of computing C programs are portable and easy to implement, meaning they can be executed across different program at different platforms with minimal changes. C also allows for efficiency and direct memory manipulation and man and management. You get making it an ideal language for performance critical operations and applications. You get. Remember, C provides higher level abstraction along with the low level capabilities which allows programmers to have fine-grained control of hardware resources when they need them you get <coughs> um, so these characteristics make C an ideal language for creating operating systems embedding embedded systems system utilities Internet of Things devices database systems and various other applications C is used everywhere actually whatever you have at home 
let me say your fridge uh, your smart fridge your TV smart TV digital TV the blender whatever it has C embedded into it mm -hmm. and uh, let's see what the future tells but in the future yeah I'll we shall learn how to create operating systems we shall learn about operating system development in C embedded systems that are base systems yeah mm -hmm. no, yeah that in the future I've not said that very soon in the future once I reach my goals yeah we shall learn about that So uh, let's write our first program in C. And now uh, this is going to be our Hello World program. Hash include std io. Don't worry about the meaning of each word I'm writing here. You will understand every word. You okay. <coughs> can. Alright, so let's understand uh, what each of these mean. <coughs> so let's start with this. Hey, I didn't write the actual program. Okay. Print F. Alright. Let's copy this. Hello. Hello world. Hello. Please subscribe to my channel L and L Training Consult and follow me on Twitter at Black Chef. Yeah, let's the please don't forget to subscribe and share and like. Thank you. Um so let's look at uh, header files in C. Uh, let's start with this hash include this hash include okay um hash include the hash include part of hash include uh, stdio.h is a preprocessor command that tells the c compiler to include a file okay i've said the hash include this okay is a a, a preprocessor command that tells the c compiler to include a file okay Specifically, it tells the compiler to include a file that is stdio.h. It's a header file. Okay, header files header files are external libraries. Okay, uh, this means that some developers have written some functionality and features that are not included at the core of the C language. Okay, by adding header files to your code you get additional functionality that you can use in your programs without having to write the code from scratch. The stdio.h header file stands for Standard Input Output Library. Okay? It contains functional definitions for input and output operations such as functions for gathering user data and printing data to the console. 
okay it provides a function such as printf and scanf so uh, this line is necessary for the function we have later in our main uh, program okay <coughs> that is the print function if you don't include stdi order.h file at the top of your code of your c code the compiler will not understand what the print f function is okay mm -hmm. so next let's look at this int main mm -hmm. <coughs> int main is the main function and starting point of every c program it is the first thing that is called when the program is executed every c program must include a main function the int keyword in the int main you get indicates that the return value of the main function in this case it will be an integer you get mm -hmm. and the void keyword here yeah that word the void keyword you get indicates that the return of the main function ah sorry the void keyword inside the main function indicates that the function receives no arguments it's void you get anything inside the curly braces is considered the body of the function and these are curly braces from here up to here you get those are curly braces <coughs> yeah any code written here will always run fast you get uh, this line acts as a a boilerplate and starting point for all C programs. It lets the computer know where to begin reading the code when it executes your programs. So next, let's look at comments. This line in green. <coughs> C comments are lines of text that give uh, get ignored by the compiler. Writing com comments is a way to provide additional information and to describe the logic, purpose, and functionality of your code. Comments provide a way to document your code and make it more readable and understandable for anyone who will write and read with it. Okay? Having comments in your, code, in your source code is helpful for your future self okay? or people who will uh, uh, maintain your code. Once they read comment, they will know what the uh, the program does. All right, guys, let's end this uh, tutorial from here. See you next time. Thank you. So, guys, welcome back. Um, last time we ended the we are talking about comments. So let's continue from there. You know, um, please be aware of uh, dogs in the background barking, because you know this way it's late in the night, and you know, yeah. So. <coughs> um, there are two types of comments single line comments and multi line comments so how do we write a single this is a single line comment you okay? get so to write a multi line comment all we do is this so have you seen this is a multi line comment you okay? get everything inside here will ins everything inside this and this will be ignored by the compiler Okay. All right, guys. Sorry. Yeah, single line comments start with two forward slashes, as I've showed you, and multi line I've showed you. Okay. Um. So, how about uh, the print f? This print f function. Okay. Inside the function is body, that is the main function. The line print f hello hello world. Please subscribe to my channel L and L or training consult and follow me on Twitter at Black Chef. Okay. <coughs> yeah, that string prints the text that you get to the console. And that text is known as a string. Whenever you want to display something. We use the printf function surround the, the surround the text you want to display in double quotation marks.
and make sure it is inside the parentheses of the print f function the semicolon terminates the statement all statement need to be ended uh, and all statements need to end with the semicolon in c mm -hmm. so after that um how do we compile our program in c all we have to do because i told you i'm using a visual studio all you do is you is it on your right you click here okay it will uh, execute your program for you let's wait and see yeah it has said hello world please subscribe to my channel that is l and l training consult and follow me on twitter or x at black chef that is it that's how it prints okay all right um this tutorial has been basically short yeah you know uh, last time i ended the video because dogs were barking a lot i was like no i don't want to spoil the video a lot, a lot so i ended it this has been the continuation of it so now let me end it see you next time guys ciao all right guys let's look at the uh, variables in c so yeah and uh, in this video you're going to learn everything about uh, variables for beginners uh, in c programming so what is a variable in c variable store different uh, kind of data in the computer's memory and take up a certain amount of space by storing information in a variable you can retrieve and manipulate it perform various calculations or even use it to make decisions in your program uh, that store is given a name and that is how you're able to access it when you need it yeah that store we're talking about is the variable so how do we declare a variable in c yeah before you can use a variable in c you need to declare it this step lets the compiler know that it should allocate some memory for it. Okay? C is a strongly typed language, remember? So to, to declare a variable in C, you first need to specify the type of data the variable will hold, such as an integer to store a whole number, a floating point number for numbers with decimal places, or a car for single characters. Character, okay? That way, due longer compilation time, the compiler knows if the variable is able to perform the actions it was set out to do. Okay. Once you have specified the data type, you give the variable name. And uh, the general syntax for declaring a, a variable is like this. First of all, uh, the data type. and the variable name that is how we declare it okay um, let's see an example here hash load stdio h um, int a it doesn't return anything so int h right that's how we declare a variable so in this example we declare the variable named h and then it holds integer values you get so what are the naming co conventions for variables in c when it comes to variable names they must begin either with a letter or an underscore for example h and uh, underscore age are valid variable names also they can contain any uppercase or lowercase letters comma numbers or an underscore character uh, there can be no other special symbols beside besides an underscore and uh, lastly variable names are okay, sensitive for example age is different with age 
those are two different variables you get because remember c is a case sensitive language so how do we initialize a variable in c so once we have declared a variable it is a good practice to initialize it which involves assigning an initial value to the variable and uh, the general syntax for initializing uh, a variable is like this assignment operator and is used to assign a value to the variable name so let's take an example hash include stdio h yeah int name doesn't return anything um, int h yeah So after that, remember what we said. We need to initialize it, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we do it? Just say age equals to 54. You get that means it takes a number or you can say age equal. 54 it's the same thing you get we initialize a variable by assigning it an integer value because the variable data type is of int with that said we can combine the initialization and the declaration step as I've showed you like that yeah we've combined everything you get so what else available about variables how to uh, update variable values in c okay the values of variable can change for example uh, you can change the value of age without having to specify its type again like how like let me show you so, include stdio standard input output and um, then int main it's a void function doesn't return any value so int h equals um, 30 okay so uh, we can change the value of h this by like this h equals to that one right just like that now that the data uh, of the new value being assigned must match the declared data type you get yeah because you can't uh, assign now here and a string you get like this no that would be totally wrong you get the data must match you get all right if it doesn't uh, uh, match the program will not run as expected it will slow a compilation error uh, sorry a compilation error right guys so that is it all about variables in c thanks for watching see you next time all right guys so last time we looked at uh, variables so this time let's look at uh, uh, basic data types in C yeah so data types are specified the type of the type of information uh, data types specify the type of form that the information can have in C programs okay and they determine what kind of operation can be performed on that information remember remember there are various built-in uh, data types in C, such as car, or char, 
comma int and float each of the data types require different allocation of memory okay before exploring each <coughs> one in more details let's first go over the difference between signed and unsigned data types in C um yeah cause you will often hear about that signed data types can represent both positive and negative values and on the other, the other hand unsigned data types can represent only non negative values zero and positive values um, you may wonder when to use signed and when to use unsigned data types I use uh, signed data types when you need to represent both positives and negative values such as when working with numbers that can have positive and negative valuations and uh, use unsigned data types when you want to ensure that the variable can only hold non-negative values such as when dealing with quantities you get and so uh, now back to our data types let's first what is let's first look at the car data type or char data type what is the char data type in c um, the most basic data type in c is a car it stands for character and it is one of the simplest and most fundamental data types in the c program language you can use it to store a single individual character such as an uppercase a lowercase of the ASCII American Standard Code for Information Interchange chart. You get um, some examples are A, small a, capital A, Z, all Z. Yeah, it can also store symbols such as now um, digits, symbols such as this. Yeah, is it an exclamation mark? can store digits like seven yeah in uh, seven like that yeah so here's a, an example of how to create a variable that will hold a car value mm -hmm. so as usual start hash and load this is the pre uh, processor directive uh, std i o h this is the header file for input output then let's make our main function and uh, it's a very function okay. all we do is car initial equals to d yeah and uh, we'll finish declaring it that's how uh, we use the single quotation marks around the single character okay this is because you can't use double quotes when working with cars okay yeah double quotes are used for strings uh, regarding memory allocation assigned car let's use tower numbers ranging from negative 128 to positive 127 and uh, uses at least one byte or eight bits of memory on the other hand unsigned car stores numbers ranging from 0 to 255 okay so we, we are done with cars now let's look at the int data type int data type all right an int is an integer um which is also known as a whole number it can hold a positive or negative value <coughs> or zero but it can't hold numbers that contain the small uh, points like 3.8 or 2.0 or 2.4 okay some example of integer zero negative three nine and now let's create let's see how we can uh, create a variable that will hold on it hash include std Int main, yeah. As I told you, main doesn't return any value, so it's void. Okay, so it's int 
page because that yeah we we'll finish declaring it okay when you declare an int the computer allocates at least two bytes all 16 bits of memory um, with that said on the most modern systems an int, the int typically holds four bytes and that is uh, 32 bits of memory okay uh, the range of numbers for an unsigned int doesn't include any of the negative numbers or in the range of mentioned uh, for signed ints okay so the range of numbers for unsigned ints that take up two bytes of memory is zero to six five three uh, six five five three five and the range uh, is zero to four uh, two nine four nine six seven two nine five for those that take up for bytes okay uh, to, uh, to represent uh, small numbers you can use another data type that is short int typically takes up to two bytes or 16 bits of memory assigned short int allows for numbers in the in the range of negative three two seven six eight two three two seven six seven get an unsigned short int allows for numbers in the range from zero to six five five three five use a short when you want to work with uh, small integers or when memory optimization is critically important yeah you should know that and uh, if you need to work with larger integers you can also use other data types like long int or long long int which provides a larger range and a higher precision a long int typically takes up 4 bytes of memory that is 32 bits um, the value for assigned long int range from negative 2 1 7 1 4 7 uh, 4 8 3 6 4 8 2 up to 2 1 7 2 1 4 7 4 8 3 6 4 7 all right that is done so next let's look uh, let's look at uh, uh, float uh, data type all right the float data type it's used to hold numbers with a decimal value which are also known as real numbers it holds four bytes or 32 bits of memory and it is a single precision floating point that type so let's see how to uh, create one as usual hash include wow, wow, wow. hash include Just like that, a double is a float point value and is the most common used floating point data type in C. It holds 8 bytes, that is 64 bits of memory, and it is a double precision floating point type. So, let's uh, see how to declare a, uh, a variable that will hold a double value. I won't delete anything apart from this. All we have to do is double number equals to the point. Yeah, that is how we declare double. So when choosing uh, which your floating point data value to use, um, consider the trade-off between uh, memory usage and precision. A float has less precision than a double, but 
than a double sorry but consumes less memory we use a fraud when memory usage is a concern such as when working with a system with limited resources or when you need to perform calculations where high precision is not critical if you require higher precision and accuracy for your calculations and memory usage during uh, an critical situations you can use a double all right mm, so after that let's look at uh, format codes in C format codes are used in input and output functions such as scanf and printf respectively okay mm, they act as uh, placeholders and substitutes for variables specifically they specify the expected format of input and output they tell the program how to format or interpret the data being passed to or read from the scan and print functions so the syntax for format codes is the percentage or modulus character and uh, the format specifier for the data type of the variable so let's look at uh, the following example um, A hash include I want delete anything. Yeah, all I have to do is int h equals thirty uh, print f print f my h is percentage. So in this example, H is the variable in the program. It is of type int. And the format code or the placeholder for the H is percentage I. And it's, this int K indicates that an integer should be printed. Um, in the program's output, I is replaced with the value of H, which is in, in this case 30. So let's look at uh, this table with a format specifier for each data type. Yeah. All right. Let me. Yeah. Um. We have percentage C uh, for cars. Yeah. Percentage it is C can be for. Percentage C can be for car and unsigned car. We have percentage I and per, and D is for int. Percentage I and D yeah, is for integers. We have unsigned int that is percentage U. Then we have short int percentage HI and percentage HD. Then we have unsigned short int percentage hu. Then long int it's percentage li or percentage ld. Then unsigned long int it's percentage lli or percentage lld. Then unsigned long long int it's percentage llu. Uh, for float it's percentage f. Then double it's percentage lf. Then long double its percentage L F. All right. Uh, let me end uh, this tutorial here. See you next time, guys. All right, guys. Um, in uh, this tutorial, let, uh, let's look at uh, the scan F function. Yeah. Okay, how to receive user input using the scanf function. So you've seen how to print something on the console using printf. Just let me show you an example of that. Hash include stdio.h 
int name is a void print if hi there that's like this like that so alright let's run it in plain text hmm. all right let's copy this code let's see put it here all right let's run it and see Terminal so it's hide there. Yeah, that's how we use the print function. So as I've said earlier, you saw how to print something to the console using the print f function. But uh, what happens when you want to receive user input? This is where we use like, the scan f function. Okay, scan f function reads user input, which is typically entered uh, via keyboard. The user enters a value presses the enter key and the value is saved in a variable and uh, the general syntax for using scan f looks like this let me show you um, scan f okay all right format string address to the variable where the variable where that will be uh, stored okay mm -hmm. so format string is the string that uh, lets the computer know what to expect okay it does uh, specifies the expected format of the input for example mm, is it a word a number or something and and variable is the pointer to the variable where you want to store the value gathered from the user input okay let's take an example have a live example of this um hash include hash include std io dot h right int main um int int number Print F please enter your H. Alright. So scan F um scan F percentage I for integer comma and uh, the memory address where we shall uh, uh, store our value, our number, our answer that is number. You get so printer f. It's all about the dogs. It's late now, late night here. Your age is your age is sorry, percentage. I comma number. Alright, let's uh, print uh, this out and see what it prints. <coughs> Enter your age 30. 30. Your age is 30. You get? Alright. That's how we get lives. Yeah, well, in uh, this example above, I first include the header that is std. Okay, it provides uh, input and output functionality. Let's see. Then main function. Then declare variable uh, called number, and it's used to uh, hold the uh, integer values. Okay. Yeah, that is where uh, we store the user input. Then 
we prompt the user to enter a number using the print function next we utilize scanf to read and save the value that the user enters okay the format specifier i lets the computer know that it should expect an integer input note that also uh, this and symbol uh, this and symbol yeah note that uh, also this and symbol before the variable name <coughs> okay yeah lastly after receiving the imp uh, input it's displayed uh, using the printf functions okay so that is all about the scan f function how to um, enter values using the okay how to enter user input during a program so guys thank you see you next time all right guys um let's look at uh, constants in c yeah as you saw earlier variable values can uh, be changed throughout the life of a program yeah with that said uh, there may be times when you don't want to uh, to, to change a value okay and uh, this is where constants come in handy in c a constant is a variable with a value that cannot be changed after declaration and uh, during the program execution you can create a constant in a similar way how you create a variable the difference between a constant and a variable is that uh, with constant you have to use the word const keyword before mentioning the data type okay and uh, when working with constants you should always specify a value okay the general syntax for declaring a constant is like this const yeah um, the data type you get constant name equals to value yeah as i've said when working with constants you should always specify a value okay here the data type represents the data type of the constant constant name is the name you choose for the constant and the value is the value for the constant uh, it is also best practice to use all uppercase letters when uh, declaring a constant is name okay yeah so let's look at uh, an example of a constant you see i should include um, std io.h int main yeah so we utilize the const uh, const keyword it's an integer let's see uh, like a now equals to six all right so uh, print f My black number is percentage i to the memory address of the variable. You get uh, lucky no. <coughs> All right, sorry. In constant, we we don't. Uh, at the memory address so in this uh, example lucky is defined as the constant with the value 7 uh, the constant name is lucky now it's in upper cases okay as this is uh, best uh, practice and convention that improves uh, readability of your code and distinguishes constants from variables okay? once you define it it cannot be modified in the program if you try to change its value uh, the C compiler will generate an error indicating that you are attempting to modify a constant. Yeah, it will print drop out an error. Okay. All right, guys, that's all about constants. Thank you very much for watching my videos. Please don't forget to subscribe for more videos. See you again next time. Ciao.
Yo, what's up guys? Good morning. Yeah, it's Abraham X here. And uh, yeah, let's continue with uh, uh, operators in C. Yeah, you know, it's a bit loud. It's a bit loud and noisy because it's raining here, but uh, I have to record this video, please. Right. Operators. Operators. So operators are essential building blocks in all programming languages. Yeah. They let you perform various operations on variables and values using symbols. And they let you compare variable and values against each other for decision making computations, you get? Um, in this tutorial, we are going to learn about the most common operators in C programming, okay? <laughs> we shall first learn about arithmetic operators, <coughs> and these allow us to perform basic mathematical operations, you get calculations. Then, we shall learn about uh, relational operators, or comparison operators, they help us to compare values. We shall learn about logic operators. Uh, they allow us to make a decision based on our conditions. Then, after understanding these fundamental operators, we shall learn about some additional operators such as assignment operators, increment and decrement operators. And by the end of this, we shall have a solid grasp of how to use uh, different operators to manipulate data. So, let's begin with arithmetic operators in C. basic arithmetic operations on uh, numeric data types um, operations including uh, addition subtraction division multiplication and uh, calculating the remainder with the division you get yeah so um, the operators are here a plus is the addition operator it does additional operations then this does uh, subtraction operations then this um, you press shift and 8 on your keyboard yeah it does multiplication operations and then this it does division and then you press shift and 5 that is uh, okay the percentage sign it's, it's used to Oh. It uh, displays a reminder after division, you get, and it's called a module. Module, yeah, or um, yeah. I don't want to complicate things. So let's uh, see some examples of how to use some of these. Now let's start with the addition operator. The addition operator let's write uh, hash include std io int main let it be a void equals to five six int b equals to 10 int sum sum equals to a plus b yeah print sorry no print f sum um, 
percentage i get comma sum all right yeah because i've already told you about the those percentage i Right, let me print it. But we have an error in our code and it's here. Mm. Now once we run it, <coughs> yeah it's 16. Okay. Why well, it's printing like this, but because it doesn't have a new line a new line uh, character and remember I told you I have problems with my keyboard especially on uh, when it comes to working on Linux yeah I don't know what's the problem with the, with the keyboard maybe I have to buy another one All right let me run it again Yeah, 16. All right. So, how about the minus? Just put here a minus. Mm -hmm. Let's print it. operator then um, how about uh, my multiplication operator we just change here still Think. yeah it's 16 how about the division operator division returns um, the modulus of these two numbers and it's a zero okay that's why you're seeing a, a zero yeah the module operator returns the remainder of the first operand when divided by the second operand okay yeah the module operator is commonly used to determine whether an, an integer is even or odd if the remainder of the operation is one then the integer is odd if the remainder <sighs> sorry if there is no remainder then the integer is even <coughs> so actually what uh, okay after the finishing this let's look at uh, relational operators yeah Relational operators are used to compare values and return a result. Okay, the result is a boolean value. A boolean value is either true, represented by one, or false, represented by zero. Mm -hmm. These operators are commonly used in decision-making statements such as if and while loops. Okay, so these are the relational operators we have in C. Uh, this equal uh, two equal signs means equal to. Uh, this plus an equal sign means not equal to um, this means greater than this means le less than uh, this means uh, greater than or equal to and this sorry sorry this means less than or equal to so how how to use them okay um the equal to operator checks if two values are, are equal it is essential to ask the question are these values equal know that uh, you can use the comparison operator equal signs to get and not equal uh, yeah uh, 
sorry let's um i don't know what i was saying i forgot you know i'm just from the bed so <laughs> i'm still dozing but i have to do this <laughs> all right uh, let's see an example of this hash include Result. All right, let's run this and see. Result one. It means it's true. You get? Because I told you one means true, zero means false. Yeah. So let's use not equal to operator. Not equal to. Yeah, you just change there and put not equal to operator. Let's run this and see. Yeah, return zero. Result zero. Zero is here. Let me actually put here a new line uh, character. zero so I think there you can see it properly so let's use the greater than greater than uh, uh, operator yeah let's print result zero that means it's false you okay? get yeah then the less than is the opposite then let's use greater than or equal to greater than or equal to and uh, it's going to print zero dollar because it's false oh sorry <laughs> greater than or equal to yeah because they are equal one of the two if it's correct then it will return one Alright guys, let me end this here. Um, uh, next we shall begin with the logical operators. See you. Alright guys, mm, welcome back. So let's look at uh, logical operators. Logic operators and C. Alright, uh, logical operators operate on uh, boring values and return a, a boring uh, value. Okay. So these are some of the logic operators we have in C and yeah that one it means logical and yeah, sorry then we have we have this
yeah those <coughs> it means logical or Then you have this, yeah, logical want. So let's learn how to use them. Yeah, so let's uh, begin with uh, the logical and operator. The logical and operator checks whether all operands are true. The result is true only when all operators are true. You get. An example is, let's say, let me put two brackets here. That's 10, 100 equals to 100. Or, What's wrong with this bracket? Oh, 10 equals to 10. Great. Yeah, this is true because 100 equals to 100 and 10 equals to 10. You get? So let's say another one. 100 equals to 1000 or 2 equals to 2. This is false because 100 doesn't look, doesn't equal to 1000, you get? So let's uh, see a logical OR, logical OR operator. Uh, it checks if at least one of the operands is true, you get? The result is true only when one of the operands is, tr is true. So like in this case, uh, this one, all are true, so it will turn true. Then 1000 equals to 1000 is, 100 equals to 1000 is false, 2 equals 2 is true. And the, the all may, um, needs to know if one of the statement is true to return true, okay? So let's look at uh, then the logical note. And the logical note operator negates the operand, you get? If the operator, if the operand, oper and is true it remains false and if it is false it returns true it returns true sorry um we may want to use not operator when uh, we want to flip the value of a condition and uh, return the opposite of what the condition evaluates to okay so uh, let's check this out Like, let me say this. Like that. Press Shift and one on your keyboard. Not. Uh, this one will be false because uh, ten equals to ten is true. You get? Yeah. So you've seen an example, and uh, let me give you another one. Ten equals to twenty. So what will it return? True, because ten doesn't equal to twenty. You get? All right. Uh, let me end this uh, tutorial here. Sh see you next time. Alright guys, um, now let's look at uh, assignment operators. Assign assignment operators are used to assign a value to a variable. Assignment operators are used to assign a value to a variable. So let's see an example of this um, with a, a program. Hash include stdio h int main 
um, so uh, let's declare an integer variable name now int num we get let's assign a value of 10 to num num equals to 10 all right so let's use a print statement that is print f um, num sign i comma uh, now so let's uh, put and see as i'm explaining you so this example we've given the value is 10 and in this case it's assigned to the variable now you get using the assignment operator this is the assignment operator you get yeah all right that's assignment operator works by evaluating the expression on the right hand side and then storing its its result in the variable on the left hand side you get all right and and uh, remember the type of data assigned should match the data type of the variable okay yeah that is all for you is the assignment operator it's this equal single equal sign okay? so let's use a let's look at a, a compound assignment operators so compound assignment operator a shorthand notations you get they allow you to modify a variable by performing an operation on it and then storing the result of the operation back in the same variable in a single state you get yeah it's this just makes your code somehow concise and easier to read and uh, some common compound assignment operators in c include plus plus sign equal yeah, that is addition and assignment equal is this and this is uh sub subtraction and assignment um wait a minute I don't know. I wrote my notes ugly. Yeah, we have uh, subtraction and and uh, assignment. It was like that. You get. Then we have uh, this plus this. That is multiplication and assignment. Then we have this and this. That is division and assignment then we have percentage and equal that is module and assignment so you've seen uh, the compound so let's take a look at an example here <coughs> please remember the best way to learn coding or programming is to practice you get yeah and uh, as I, I told you in the beginning of this series it's better you get a book along Oh, yeah so that you whatever you don't understand you look at the video you, you do the exercises that's and please don't forget to subscribe to my channel like it and share please thank you so hash include sd <coughs> h int uh, main so int now equals to 10 now plus equal to 5 okay and f now percentage <coughs> i now yeah let's print this So in this example above we created a variable we named it now and assigned it it an initial value of 10 okay yeah it says um, the answer is 15 why 
place. Let me first do something here. Uh, this. slash n then let me print it again yeah as i've told you we created a variable we get we named it number and assigned it's it an initial value of 10 mm. then we implemented the value variable by 5 to do this we used plus equal operand you get um, the line num plus equal increments the value of num by 5 and the result is 15 and it's stored back in the num in just one step it's stored back in the num in variable okay it's 15 so all we did first of all we give it we gave it an initial value of 10 then we incremented it plus equal to 5 okay yeah that is it so uh, still we have some other operators mm, if i say then minus or equal to five okay uh, and uh, you've already guessed the answer it's five you get yeah because first of all we give it an initial value of 10 then now minus we first subtract five equal to five you get mm -hmm. we subtract we subtract five from this 10 that means it's five you get so let's look at the uh, increment and decrement operators and the increment that is plus 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 this is the increment operator and then minus minus that's the decrement operator right mm, yeah so the increment and decrement operators decrement or increment a variable by one respectively okay Let's look at uh, an example hash include stdio that is int main um, so int num equals to ten okay then we say num plus plus As I've told you, uh, the increment and decrement, uh, the decrement or increment are variable by one respectively. So, the, what will be the answer here? The answer will be 11. Now, <coughs> um, um, percentage I. Now. Um, so, Let's print it out and see. Yeah, it says 11, as you can see. So let's uh, uh, decrement it. Mm, minus, minus, num, minus, minus. Yeah, it's nine. It decrements the value by one. All right, guys. Let me end this here. See you next time. Hey, guys. Welcome. Um, <coughs> today we are going to look at uh, conditional statements. Yeah, for the examples actually we've seen so far in this series, mm -hmm. all execute line by line from top to bottom. They are non-flexible and dynamic and do not adapt according to user's behavior or specific situations, you get? So in this, uh, in this tutorial, we'll learn how to make decisions and control the flow of a problem. We can get to set the rules on what happens next in our problems by setting conditions using conditional statements. Um, all you have to know is conditional statements take a specific action based on the result of a comparison that takes place. Okay? Uh, the problem will decide where the next step should be based on whether 
the condition are met or not. Mm -hmm. And certain parts of the program may not run depending on the result or depending on certain user inputs. The user can go down different parts uh, depending on the various forks in the road that comes up during a program's life. Okay? So first we shall learn about the if statement and that is the foundation uh, building block of decision making in C. We will also learn about else if and else statements that are added to the if statement provide additional flexibility to the program. Then we will learn about the Tinella operator which basically allows us to condense decision making logic into a single line of code and improve the readability of our program. So how do we create a, an if statement in C? The most basic conditional statement in C is actually the if. It makes a decision based on a condition. If the given condition evaluates to true only, then is the block inside of the if block executed. If the given condition evaluates to false, the code inside the if block is ignored and skipped. So, uh, the general syntax for an if statement in C is as follows. Um, if a condition if condition uh, sorry uh, run code if condition is true yeah so uh, why don't we take an example this all right um, hash include std i hold it h int main doesn't take any arguments void all right so uh, let's write a variable. I've told you read about variables. A variable int h h int h. All right. So uh, let's use a, a scan f because I've already told you about to enter the our age okay uh, let's prompt the user to enter the age okay so print f is enter the age So let's store users answer in the variable. Let's check if h is uh, less than 18. Okay. If h is less than 18. If it is, if it is, then and only then. Also, if 
let's write the logic if it's less than 18 print if you need All right, let's run this statement. Just know that in the above statement, we create a variable named age that holds an integer value. We then uh, prompt the user to enter their age and store the answer in the variable age. Okay, then we create the condition that checks uh, to see whether the value contained in the variable age is less than 18. If so, we want to print a message to the console letting the user know that the the proceed uh, that to proceed the user that we should be at least 18 years of age or older when asked for age and enter let me say 15 we should get the uh, enter age 14 and uh, sorry 14 What doesn't print? What's the problem with our statement? I don't know. Let's check and see. Let's check and see. Um. Percentage scan F percentage I yeah and H is our value that's where we store but it isn't printing on the screen I don't know why <sighs> is it still executing let me stop this let me execute again and see the problem is this code guys please tell me please 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 just help me with this I want to know what is the problem okay let me end the tutorial here I check for the problem then we shall hey guys what's up yeah actually last time I left off mm, I had some L in my uh, in uh, our program so I had to check oh, what's the problem with it yeah and uh, right now everything is okay if I, I try to execute it works so this mm -hmm. once I say uh, age is 14 or any below 18 it says you need to be over 18 to continue that is it Right, once I, uh, I say I'm um, 18, let's say 78, yeah, doesn't print anything, that means it's good. Right, in this code above, now we created a variable named age, uh, this, yeah, and uh, it holds an integer value. Then we prompted the user to enter their age and stored it uh, in the variable age, okay, then we created a condition 
and the checks whether the value contained in the uh, this is the condition condition okay now we created it to check whether the value contained um the value contained in the variable age is less than 18 if so now we wanted to print a message to the console letting the user know that to proceed the user should be at least 18 years of age or older uh, when asked for let me say uh, the age I uh, first of all printed 14 or 12 you get and I got a message that you need to be over 18 please to continue okay uh, the condition that is the condition mm, highlighted evolves to true so the code in the if block executes then we recompile and then we run the problem um, and this time when uh, asked our age we said 78 you okay? get yeah we didn't get any output that means everything was good all right so how do we because we talked about uh, if else statements i remember so how do we create one if else statement <coughs> um we should add an else statement hmm, to an if to provide code that uh, will execute only when the if statement evolves evolves to false the if else statement essentially means that if the condition is true do uh, do the following thing else do uh, this thing instead you okay? um if the condition inside the parentheses evaluates to true the code inside the if block will execute but the condition evaluates to false the code inside the else block will execute the else keyword is the solution for when the if condition is false and the code inside the if block doesn't run okay it it uh, actually works like an uh, alternate alternative so let's hide here an if else statement else print f you are good to go and uh, let's check you are good to go good it uh, prints because we are not uh, uh, we are, it was not less than 18 okay it's over 18 so it says you're good to go okay so um let's add how about if we add an if else statement is it else if okay yeah else if statement sorry <laughs> um so here let's say else if age equal to um let me see my answer 20 huh let's check and see what it prints it's okay we have our code else if h equal to 20 print you you can take a beer all right let me print on the Age 20. You can take a beer, all right. Conditions one on one. Mm. So, we've learned how to write an if statement, else if statement, else statement. Yeah, those are the conditions. Mm -hmm. So, what else? How the, there is something called we say that you can combine all these in one. That is the Tinali operator. So let me first write this up. stdio.h int uh, main 
it's a void okay doesn't return any parameters so the, let's look at the itinerary operators get the itinerary operator also known as a conditional operator allows you to write an if else statement with fewer lines of code okay it can provide a way of writing more readable and concise code and comes in handy when we are writing simple conditional expressions we would want to use it when uh, we are making uh, simple decisions and want to keep our code concise and on one line okay however it's best to stick to a regular if else statement when we are dealing with the uh, more complex decision as the tinderly could uh, make our code um, like hard to learn okay hard to read sorry so uh, the general syntax for a channel operator looks something uh, like this let's write first of all the condition to be evaluated to get then we've put a question mark expression if true expression if false actually um i don't normally use this even <laughs> i've never used it in a program yeah even now I don't know how to write it because I've never used it. I used it when I was learning it and that, that was back then it, yeah so let's break down all this uh, the condition is uh, the condition you want to evaluate you okay? get con this condition will evaluate either to true or false um then the question mark separates the condition from the two possible expressions expression if true is ex executed if the condition ever is true yeah mm. and uh, this colon name this yeah this um it's used to separate uh, the expression if true from expression if false and lastly expression if false is executed if the condition ever is too false okay so let's take a look at uh, at an example of this but why don't I give it to you as an exercise yeah see you next time guys let me end here mm, this is your first exercise please yeah you can uh, drop your answer in the comment below please I hope it thank you ciao alright guys um <coughs> let's learn how to create loops yeah loops in C um so uh, in this tutorial uh, we are going to learn about loops mm, which are essential for automating uh, repetitive uh, tasks uh, without having to write the same code multiple times you get <coughs> so loops allow us to execute a specific block of code uh, instructions repeatedly over and over again until a certain condition is met okay so we will learn about the different types of loops such as for loop, while, do, while loop and do while loop and understand their syntax and when we should use each one okay? so <coughs> we shall also learn about the black statement which allows us to control the execution flow within the loop in a specific way so first of all this starts with the for loop a for loop allows us to execute a block of code uh, repeatedly based on a specific condition. It's useful when we know how many times we want to repeat a certain action. And uh, the general syntax for a for loop is for um, <coughs> initialization um, condition increment or decrement yeah um, code to be executed Ex 
going to be executed in each iteration okay yeah that is uh, the general syntax for us a uh, follow up okay so let's break it down mm -hmm. first of all initialization is the step where we initialize a loop a uh, control variable okay uh, condition is a condition that is evaluated before each iteration if the condition is true the loop continues if it's false the loop terminates okay the loop will run as long as the condition remains true increment uh, decrement is the part responsible for changing the loop control uh, variable after each for uh, loop control variable after each iteration it can be an increment plus plus or a decrement minus minus or any other modification okay <coughs> then code to be executed in each iteration is the block of code inside the full lupus body that gets executed in each iteration if the condition is true so let's see an example of a follow <coughs> a follow hash include std i object h int main doesn't have arguments um, all right so uh, for int i equals to one that is the condition i less than five mm -hmm. then i plus plus all right so let's print print f hmm. okay. iteration iteration percentage i Let me, no, sorry about that. Let me put a new line um, collector. You know, I have problems with that uh, backslash. I don't know how to implement it. I tried to to rewrite the key, uh, keyboard keys, but it failed. So just left it the way it is. So um, let me add foot and see. It's done uh, as you can see in this example we first initialize the loop control variable i with a value one okay then the condition is i uh, less than or equal to five and is true okay <coughs> so the lupus body is executed and the iteration one is printed after each iteration okay the value of i is incremented by one so I is incremented to two and so on until uh, the final point is reached. Okay, as simple as that. So, um, let's see how to create a uh, while loops mm, in C. So, as you have seen in uh, the, the, this a example, a for loop is used when you know the exact number of iteration you want the loop to perform. The while loop is useful when you want to repeat an action based on a condition but don't know the exact number of iteration beforehand, okay? So it's the general syntax is like this. Um, <coughs> while condition, can I write condition? Right. Then now uh, the code to be executed goes here. Code ex execute. All right. Um, with the while loop, the condition is uh, evaluated before each iteration. Okay. If the condition is true, the loop continues. If it's false, the loop terminates. The while loop uh, will continue as long as the condition evaluates to true. Uh, something to note uh, 
with the while loop is that the code in the loop's body is not guaranteed to run. Yeah, even at least one time if a condition is not met. So let's see an example of it. Um, <coughs> let's put here a variable int count equals to one. So while Our count is less than or equal to five. Our count is less than or equal to five. Let's print. Let's print. Here, utilize print f. Um, iteration percentage i. Let's call, call our count variable and let's see. Hey, it's going to run forever. Do you know why? Uh, that is an infinite loop. All we have to do is stop it. So we had to increment. We forgot to increment in any so we made it an infinite loop. So let's run again. Alright, iteration one, iteration two, iteration three, iteration four, iteration five. Um let me break it down for you and see. Let's, uh, let's add a new line character. What's wrong? Yeah, iteration one to up to five. Guys, that is uh, a way loop for you. So what next? So um, in this example you've seen first we initialize a variable count with a value one, okay? before it runs any code. The while block checks the condition. Yeah, the condition count has done all equal to five is true because count is initially one. So the loop's body is executed and iteration is repeated. Then count is incremented two, to three, to four, and then to five, okay? Mm. But please, guys, note um, as you've seen, we've accidentally made an infinite loop, and that may crash your system. Okay, so we have always to remember if you don't, uh, you know, this condition has all as evaluated to true after printing the, the, the line inside the curly braces, it continuously check whether it should run the code again. Yeah. and the answer is always yes yeah so we had to put this uh, increment count so that it ends okay where it is supposed to end so guys let me end there uh, next we are going to look at uh, hey guys what's up um actually this is going to be a short tutorial and uh, we are going to look at uh, mainly do a loop. Yeah, you've seen uh, about for loops and while loops. So in this tutorial, we're going to look at uh, it's a short tutorial about do while loops. Yeah, but as we seen earlier in the while loop, the code in the while loop's body is not guaranteed to run even at least one time if the condition is not met. A do while loop executes a block of code repeatedly for as long as the condition remains true. However, in contrast to a while loop, it is guaranteed to run at least once, regardless of whether the condition is true or false from the beginning. So, the do while loop is useful when you want 
to ensure that the, the lupus body is executed at least once uh, before the condition is checked. Mm -hmm. So, the general syntax for do a loop is like this. Do. Sorry. Do. Yeah. Like this. And then, a while condition here. Okay. It's kind of like that. Yeah. So, let's look at... Uh, an example of a do while loop um let's say we have an int int one okay so down this two um, just print f we take uh, this Statement here. Good. Put it here. Yeah. Count while. Comes here. Check. Mm. I want to uh, disable this keyboard thing. Yeah. Right. And it has printed everything out, guys. Now, I don't know the letters. What's wrong with, with them? How do we enlarge the letters, guys? I don't know. Let me check here. Our preferences. Setting extension, keyboard shortcuts, themes, configure, snap. How about here? How about view? I'll drop extension appearance for screen centered memory. Editors layout split to columns. Hmm. So, how do we ah, enlarge the words? I don't know. Preferences. I don't know. Let me first leave it until the end of this tutorial. And I think, yeah, this is the end because, okay, let me explain a bit. Uh, first of all, in the above code, first we initialize a variable count with a value one. Okay, a do I loop. Uh, first does something and then checks a condition so the block of code inside the loop is executed at least one time the string iteration one is printed and then count uh, and then count is incremented to two you get the condition now uh, count less than or equal to five is then checked and it evaluates to true so the loop continues the loop will continue as long as the count is less than five after the iteration where count is 6, the condition becomes false and the loop terminates. Alright, guys, okay, see you. Let me go sleep. See you in the morning. Yo, what's up, guys? Um, So, today we have yet another short video, short tutorial, and it's going to be about uh, break statements in C. But before we continue, guys, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel please subscribe because you've seen i make these videos very late in the night after work yeah when i'm very tired so please all you can do for me is to subscribe 
yeah you subscribe you share and you like the videos and please drop down the comments tell me where to improve okay because i want this to be our community where i can produce all these these uh, good uh, videos you get thank you very much guys so today i'm going to use uh, atom on a daily basis i've been using uh, uh vs code so today i'm going to use atom all right so let's continue first of all let me first write this std h int our main yeah, it's a void function so what is a break statement the break statement is used to immediately exit a loop and terminate its execution it's a con control flow statement that allows you to interrupt the normal normal loop um, execution and uh, move on to the code after the loop okay the break statement is especially useful when you want to exit the loop under specific condition even if the loop is termination condition hasn't been met okay we might use it when we encounter a certain value or when a specific condition is met so let's see an example of a break statement <coughs> Uh, let's use just a moment please Alright, so let's continue. Let's write int target equals to five. So four int i equal to one mm, i less than or equal to ten mm, i plus plus let's print f print f current value value percentage percentage i sorry comma i all right so let's call an if statement if i if i equals to target what can we do print Uh, print target value reached target value target value reached existing uh, exiting exiting loop all right let's break So that's how we utilize a, a break statement in C. Okay, let me print. Uh, let me run this code. I don't know. <laughs> I'm forgetting. I'm. I don't know. Maybe I'm very tired. I'm forgetting how to run. But this. Um, guys, please drop down in the comment. How do we? run code in atom i think i'm getting daisy dizzy 
yeah totally tired and today it's been uh tiresome because you know had this um computer was i had this computer that i was repairing today but it was a, a big one and it gave me hard time so i'm really tired today <sighs> yeah that's why even i can't <laughs> remember anything please guys drop me down a comment how to run code because mm, i've never used atom yeah i'm always notepad uh vs code and uh div plus 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 code blocks yeah and uh nano i've not used B vim and atom so and i think i'm an idiot <laughs> okay guys uh, let's stop uh, here um see you tomorrow in the evening when i'm doing uh arrays in c all right guys good night Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, wherever you are. Please subscribe, like, and share. Drop down your comments. I'll reply as immediately as I get them. All right. Yo, what's up, guys? Yeah, actually, uh, last time we left off, we are looking at uh, loops in uh, uh, in C. So today. We are going to begin uh, a new chapter that is arrays. I want to look at arrays and everything about arrays. So, uh, without further ado, let's get started. But please, guys, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Don't forget to follow and don't forget to share my wisdom, please. Okay, all right, arrays. Um, they offer a versatile and uh, organized way to store uh, multiple pieces of related data that are arranged in an ordered uh, sequence and uh, they allow us to store multiple of values of the same data type and a single identifier and perform repetitive tasks on each element so in um, here in this tutorial we are going to learn how to declare and initialize uh, arrays. We will also learn how to access individual elements within an array. Um, that uh, will be using uh, index notation and modify uh, I, uh, and uh, how to modify them. Sorry. So we shall learn how to use uh, loops to iterate through array elements and uh, perform operations on each element. So first of all, how do we declare and initialize an array in C? To declare any array in C, we first specify the data type of the element that the array will store. This means we can create arrays of type int, float, char, and so on. We then specify the array's name followed by the array size in the square brackets. You get? remember the size of the array is the number of elements that it can hold uh, this number must be a positive integer but keep in mind that uh, arrays have fixed size and uh, once we declare them we cannot change it later on so let's see the general syntax for an array mm -hmm. Data type. size all right so that is the genus syntax for declaring uh, an array so let's see an example let's take it Okay, 
Okay, so let's see this int. That is the data type, grace. That is the array name. Size five array size. Okay. Guys, okay, as simple as that. That's how we declare an array. So in this example we've created we've created an array first of all it's called grids it's of integer type oh, sorry. and it has it should have five member elements okay <coughs> yeah so after declaring uh, this array we can uh, initialize it with the uh, initial values again okay? to do this we use the assignment or operator followed by uh, carry braces the carry braces um, these are carry braces kind of these yeah these are called carry braces um so carry braces will uh, enclose the values and uh, each value needs to be separated by a comma okay so uh, let's learn how to initialize uh, the grids in an array okay so all we do is take out this to put uh, this um, assignment operator because it should take five elements so let's uh, one two three four five all right so uh, we've created the array this is the data type this is the name this is the member so these are the initial values there are five values because in our array it says should contain five values but uh, keep in mind that uh, the number of values should match the array size okay you can't put here seven values yet the array size is five okay yeah otherwise you will encounter errors uh, something to note here is that uh, you can also partially initialize the array just like this mm, let me take out this all right like that it's allowed and in this case the remaining two uh, elements will be set to zero Another way to initialize an array is to omit the array length inside the square brackets and only assign the initial values like this. Um, in grades, because if it, um, sorry, fifteen. Forty-six, like that. Yeah, actually, we've omitted the array length, and uh, we we've just initialized the sorry. Yeah, I have to put the square brackets here, like that. All right. So here yeah, by the so once you see it like this it means um, its length is five because we've assigned five values to it so now how to how to find the length of an array in C using the size of operator yeah whenever you want to find the size of uh, any anything in C you just have to use the size of operator okay so mm, remember the size of operator comes in handy when we need to calculate size of anything that's what I've told you mm, now let's see an example here sorry mm -hmm. now let's print f Let's first set the size of it, okay? Int array size equals to size of grades. Yeah, size of grades. 
well. Now in our print statement size I can't write size of great is size of great is total percentage I Because our size is kept in uh, this variable array size, we shall call the array size right. Let's run it and see what it prints out. And size of grades is 20 bytes. Yeah, that is it. Mm. Let me put a, a new line. You know how we put a, a new line now. <laughs> now thingy, you know. <laughs> the keyboard is disturbing because on Windows, it, all keys are functioning as expected. But when we come to my Ubuntu machine, is it becomes lousy so the backslash mm, the backslash key doesn't uh, function when i'm using it on uh, ubuntu i don't know why did i get the keyboard guys no i can't think right now I'm just dumb. <laughs> Alright, <coughs> the keyboard is here. So I want to what? Put here backslash. Only that. Yeah, it disturbs me a lot. We run it and see. Yeah, it so says size of grid is 20 bytes. Mm -hmm. So you've seen the size of um, we calculate the total size of the array in, in bytes. Yeah, and in this case, the array have uh, has five integers. Sorry, as may mentioned uh, before, that on most uh, modern operating system, an entity we call it occupies uh, 4 bytes of memory therefore the total size of 5 by 4 is 20 bytes of memory for the entire array okay mm -hmm. so uh, let's check how much memory each int occupies with the size of operator okay Stats uh, on zero, you okay? get expected and expression size of index zero. Oh, the name of whatever of the variable that stores the array. Mm -hmm. So, let's see now print f. of a single element and which I bytes so element size because it's the 
a valuable store in this size. I just copy this. Right. Mm -hmm. Size the size of grid is twenty bytes. Size of a single element is four bytes. Alright guys. That is it. So see you next time. Ciao. Alright guys. Um we left uh, we left off last time by looking at the fundamentals of our race in C. So let's continue. And uh, in this tutorial we are going to look at how to access array elements in C. But first of all, please don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to like and don't forget to share. And follow me on my socials, please. Thank you. So, how to access arrays in C? Um, we can access each element in an array by specifying its index or its position in the array. Okay. Note that in C, indexing starts at zero instead of one. So, the index of the first element is zero. The index of the second element is one, and so on. Okay, um, the last element in an array has an index of array size minus one. So to access individual elements in the array, we specify the array's name followed by the element's index number inside square brackets. All right, so let's see an example of this. So let's create our array here, right? This is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, let's print them out and see. Yeah, 
segment out. They are printed out just like that. Yeah, not in uh, this example. To access each item from the array, from the integer array grid, uh, grid you get. Uh, we had to specify the array's name along with the item's position in the R in the array inside square brackets. You get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So remember that the index starts uh, from zero. So grade zero uh, gives us the first element and so on. Okay. Not that uh, if we try to access an element within an index number that is higher than the array size, the compiler will return a random number. Okay. Um. So, um, what next? Let's, let's see an example of that. Um, index seven. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I've seen what it has done. Return zero. Get it just picks a random element and returns it. So how do we modify array elements in C? So we've known how to access arrays. You can then modify them. We can change the value of an element by assigning a new value to it using its index. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? So, I said using its index. Let's see zero. Uh -huh. So, let's do like this. This is the R name. Index zero. Let's assign it. What is that? This is the new element. All right, let's print uh, whatever is that uh, at index zero, okay, and see what it prints out. It says 1000. Okay. Oh, okay, let's print a second one. Close. At, um, at one equals to one. one. seen how to do that now we need uh, to apply uh, some loops to arrays um, how to loop through an array in C so by looping through an array we can access and perform operation on each element sequentially you okay? and uh, normally we use uh, for loops to, e to iterate through the arrays okay so how do we do that let's oh, huh. I'm 
I'm sorry. Let's do like this. Let me take uh, off that part. So let's write the for loop here because you've already seen how to use for loops and i equals to zero. I is done or equal to five i plus plus. Yeah, let's print f mm -hmm. elements at index what index should I put it is i <laughs> yeah let's add something i Yes, there are no errors. Let's print it out and see. Mm -hmm. Element at index element nine zero zero zero. There is an error in our code. All right, let's check it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've said print f element at index. Let's see. Let's print again and see. Element at index. We've not uh, printed the index. Great. Mm, for I. Try to look at it. What? What? What is wrong? Percentage. I. Let me try to print and see. Saying what? From what expect a matching paint argument. Okay. So. For i, int i equals to zero. Um, int grants equals to this. Okay, for int percentage print elements at index of percentage. Oh, guys, I forgot here something. Sorry. Yeah. Elements at index one. All right. That's how we do it. Yeah, I remember. Have you seen my uh, photo? image of a programmer's day life check on twitter you will see it uh, yeah it, it can look like a simple error but it can take a ton of your time to find it out yeah all right so when using a for loop to loop through an array we have to specify the index as well as the loop variable okay and then use the size to access each element, each array element. Yeah, um, the percentage I press order, there are two, are replaced with the current index I and the value at that index in the grid array. Okay? Um, let's try also a while loop on the arrays and see. So, let me take off the for loop. 
int i equals let's pass initialize so while i is less than five print f elements at index just like we did last time at oh, percentage i percentage i get Guys, do you know what we've done? We are running an infinite loop. Yeah, I forgot. I plus plus. Right, let's run it again and see. Mm. Yeah, it's done. It's a while loop. Alright, guys, see you next time. Hey, guys, what's up? Yeah, it's LA Abraham X here. Yeah. And uh, today we are going to be looking at C strings. <coughs> but first of all, don't forget to click the like button, sh a subscribe, and share, please. Yeah, tell your friends to tell their friends about us. Thank you. Um, today I'm using a virtual machine, I'm using uh, Windows 8 virtual machine. Yeah, it's here. This is my, my Ubuntu machine. I'm using a Windows 8 and I'm using div pool, div plus plus for C plus plus for development. But we are developing C, not C plus plus. Yeah, actually today we are going to be looking at strings. We first take out this. So strings. Remember in the previous chapter we learned about the basics of arrays. Now it's time to learn about strings. It's a special kind of an array, you okay? get? Our strings are everywhere in programming. They are used to represent names, messages, passwords, and more. In this chapter, we'll learn about strings in C and how they are stored as arrays of characters. You will also learn about the, the fundamentals of string manipulation. Specifically, we will learn how to find a string length and how to copy concatenate compare strings in C so what are strings in C a string is a sequence of characters like letters numbers symbols that are used to represent text in C strings are actually arrays of characters and each character in the string has a specific position within the array Another unique characteristics of strings, characteristic of strings in C is that at the end of every one, there is the hidden um, forward slash zero character called the null terminator. Okay, so uh, kind of like this zero. Mm. It's, it's there. No. Terminator, yeah, it's the null uh, character, null terminator. Uh, this terminator lets the computer know where the string ends. You get, yeah, it denotes the end of a string. So the string hello in C is stored as hello like this. 
hello yeah that's how it's stored so how do we create strings in C uh, one way to create a string in C is to initialize an array of characters <coughs> one way of creating a, st a string in C is to initialize an array of characters the array will contain the characters that make up the string here let's see how to initialize an array to create the string hello welcome and subscribe to our channel okay let's uh, write some kind something like that car word Not how we specify that the array should um, should be left by default empty. You get? Because if I wanted, I would do, I would have uh, put here any number, but I didn't. I left it by uh, like zero by default. You get? Mm -hmm. So uh, the number of letters here will be the number of the array size. You get? Mm -hmm. So let's print this and see what it what it prints that is oh we have an error we have an error let me see hash include in main um car Small error, but I don't know where it is. Um, let me first take out this int main. It's not. <laughs> guys and you know why it's not printing <laughs> i think i'm down i didn't tell it to print remember this <laughs> ah, i don't know you remember this yeah <laughs> we had to tell it to print you get <laughs> ah, okay, let's print this string. S. Mm, dot slash n. Comma. What? So. All right. <laughs> it has printed. <laughs> ah, I don't know most programmers are weird actually and i think i'm the chairman of weirdos so okay another way to create a string in c is to store a string literal okay in this case you create an array of uh, characters and then assign the string by enclosing it in uh, double quotes um just like this let me take out this like this um call okay. call one because
consult for our videos. Alright, see? Yeah, that's printed. Just that. Alright. I'm with string retros. The null terminator that I told you about is implied. Creating strings with strong uh, string literals is easier as you don't need to add the null terminator at the end. This method is also much more readable and requires less code. However, you may want to use uh, character arrays when you want to modify the string's content. Okay? String literals are read only, meaning the content is fixed. Alright guys, let's end it here. See you in the next video. Ciao. Hey guys, um, let's continue from where we left off uh, last time. We had introduced strings. So, today we are looking at uh, manipulation of strings in C. Okay, let's uh, begin straight away. C provides functions that allow you to perform operations on strings, such as copying, concatenation, and comparing name a few uh, to use these functions we first need to include the string dot h header file do you know how to include an header file just like this Sorry. Hush. include string dot h all right so uh, after including a file, you know you get full functionality of that function in your code, you get? Mm -hmm. So, first of all, let's see how to find the length of a string in C. Alright, let's do that. Um, actually, let me take this one off in main. Mm -hmm. Chill. Let's name it phase. Phase. Mm. Subscribe. Subscribe to my channel. Alright, so like that is the int length. Equals str then of phase phrase phase yeah of phase print f um, string length is percentage i and that is for new line and right, let's see string length is 23 characters All right that is done I told you to uh, to see the output you just place f11 or this uh, button this one you just run this one you just compile this one you run this one you compile and run that is f11 on your keyboard All right, mm, the str uh, len function will return the number of characters that make up the string. Not that uh, the result does not include the null terminator. Okay, so next let's see how to copy strings in C. How do we to copy one string into another one? You can use str cpy or string copy function. You may want to copy a string in C when you need to make changes to it without modifying it. It comes in handy when you need to keep the original string's content intact. Alright, so um, the strcpy function copies original string to, to destination string including the null terminator. One thing to note here is that you need to make sure the destination array has enough space for the ori original string 
okay let's see uh, that code eight nine um already nor already nor equals to please share right and subscribe subscribe so uh, destination car based because what is it? Um car destination equals to uh, let's say no, let's leave it like this twenty twenty characters. So say print f because we are using our print uh sorry print f copied sorry um, we you, you use now our str copy function like this uh, this then the original Ignore. So we say uh, copy string that is a percentage s. Then the new line, comma, best. Let's see whether it works. Yeah, copy the string. Please share, like, and subscribe. All right, guys. Mm. But thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to, to like. Don't forget to share. Tell your friend to tell their friends about us. Thank you. And by the end of this video, you will be a competent malware author. As a red teamer, as a pen tester, as a blue teamer, you'll be able to write any kind of malware. Alright. The first question after going everything about the introduction what is malware because you always hear the news malware 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 what is malware malware is any software any software intentionally designed to cause disruption to a computer sorry about that noise it was my brother entering the room but as i've said malware is any software intentionally designed to cause disruption to a computer, server, client, or computer network. To leak private information, gain unauthorized access to information or systems, deprive access to information, or which unknowingly interferes with the user's computer security and privacy. That is malware. So, what is malware development? We've defined what a malware is. Then what is malware development? This is the development process of malicious software or scripts with intent to stealing target information, spying, espionage purposes, and others. Yeah. In order to become a competent malware developer, you have at least to know one programming language. But what are the best programming languages for malware developers? What do they refer best? In my own opinion, and most others, assembly is the number one language for malware authors because it's faster and it's next to machine code. But remember, it's very hard to learn. And uh, a few people out there know how to code in assembly. Then, after assembly, uh, C and C++. As I've told you, this course is about C and C++ programming. So, that is, in my own opinion, those are the two second programming languages if you want to be a competent malware developer. Then, uh, third, Python. Python programming. If you know that, 
and uh, in the future we shall learn C, C++ and on the back end Python because actually according to now I prefer Python on the server side okay then after that uh, Rust, Lua and Golang according to me in my own opinion those are the best programming languages for malware developer actually even uh, Java yeah I had forgot about Java Java is also good Java and C++ they are good all right let's go ahead so but uh, we've talked about uh, the best programming languages then uh, what is computer programming yeah because somebody will ask programming languages what are programming language computer programming or coding is the composition of sequence of instructions uh, called programs that computers can follow to perform tasks as simple as that what is computer programming computer programming or coding is the composition of sequence of instructions called programs that computers can follow to perform tasks all right back to what we we're talking about malware types yeah there are a lot of malware type types out there and of recent what is uh, most trending is ransomware ransomware everywhere so that's what we shall start with ransomware this is software that uses encryption to disable as a target is access to its data until a ransom is paid the victim organization is rendered partially or totally unable to operate until it pays but there is no guarantee that the payment will result in the necessary decryption key or that the decryption key will be provided okay or it will function properly yeah because uh, most guys they are like once i i pay the ransom they will provide me with the decryption key but in most cases it's not the case all right the second type is spyware um this is uh especially used the uh, used by military agencies worldwide yeah spyware collects information about users activity without their knowledge or consent this can include password pins payment information and so unstructured messages uh, desktop uh, screens and everything that is vital to the user it can be collected by spyware then after that let's talk about tro trojan horses um trojan horses have you um, let me ask everybody have you ever watched this movie Helen of Troy yeah where they used uh, the Trojan horse to enter the uh, uh, Troy city yeah so that is that's where the name comes from for this kind of malware this disguises itself as desirable code or software once downloaded by unsuspecting user the Trojan can take control of the victim's system for malicious purposes you get Trojans may hide in games, apps, or even software patches. So, please, guys, everybody out there, if you are tech survey or uh, somebody else, uh, don't just click on every link that uh, points to a good game, that points to that best app you feel like. In most cases, it has a backdoor, or it has a back, or it has a Trojan embedded in its code. All right, let's go ahead so the next example is keyloggers those are very sophisticated it's still a kind of spyware it monitors users activities keyloggers can be used to steal uh, password data banking information and other sensitive information keyloggers can be inserted into a system through phishing attacks social media uh, social engineering techniques or malicious downloads and uh, in the future in still in this series i'll show you all those techniques how can you develop a malicious uh, website so that uh, you can direct users to that site to steal their information remember all this is for education purposes please don't use this series to learn uh, all these techniques so that you can steal money from banks you can steal people's passwords please it's illegal and once you're in trouble everything is wrong so this is for totally education purposes 
all right and then number eight we have bots or botnets a bot is a software application that performs automated tasks on command they are used for legitimate purposes such as indexing search engines but when used for malicious purposes they take the form of self-propagating malware that can connect back to a central server that is the c2c server all right after that fileless malware um actually i'm not very competent about this file of fileless malware and i'm going to consider it in the research i'm doing of recent yeah i want to learn about it i want to know about it because this is uh, this kind doesn't install anything initially instead it makes changes to files that are that are native to the operating system such as PowerShell or WMI because the operating system recognizes the edited files as legit a fileless attack is not home by any antivirus software out there you get what I'm saying all right after learning about the types of malware what else malware terms yeah because if you want to be really a content malware developer out there you have to know the terms that we use in malware okay because you will hear something like a payload and you're like damn what is that all right malware payloads what first of all what is a staged malware stage um, okay stage malware or stage payloads stage payloads break down the distinct uh, the distinct phases of an attack you get because uh, first of all uh, if you develop a stage malware first of all you will develop a dropper a dropper it's a tiny piece of code but all it does is to drop onto the target system and calls back to the main server it will call the next part the next stage you get and in most cases you can uh, the next stage can be a keylogger or the main malware you get it can be a keylogger it can be the the back door anything uh it will be according to your decision so as i've said stage payloads break down the distinct phases of an attack often often using a multiple payload phases that a single payload would have otherwise performed you get this payload payloads are typically broken down into a stage initial payload or the beacon executable and the main payload you get mm -hmm. a stadia is a small executable that is an initial payload it is a relatively small piece of code that is executed to prepare for a much larger and more capable payload known as the stage payload you get uh, this means that a stadia sets the stage for the main payload then what is a stageless malware or stageless payload a stageless payload are self-contained and usually much larger in size than a stage payloads. Mm -hmm. They typically combine all the required capabilities of an attack into one executable. Alright, then what is shellcode? Because uh, you had me earlier talking about shellcode. We shall learn about shellcode. So, shellcode is a malicious code that attempts to hijack the normal flow of a a running program in computer memory it then redirects the flow so that the malicious code is executed instead of the normal program giving the attacker shell or a reverse shell mm -hmm. these are often beacons or payloads in the form of low-level programming code or a, or a machine code combined with an exploit that is shell code for you other terms to be uh okay sorry and uh, most dangerous malware out there normally contains exploits exploits are pieces of low level or native code that are successfully leverage a vulnerability you get exploited vulnerabilities often involve a buffer overflow in an application's memory where the attacker has over overrun the allocated memory to redirect no more program flow and a successful exploit will then lead to the execution of a payload and in most cases that payload is malware so i've talked about a dropper what is a dropper a dropper 
is a kind of Trojan that that has been designed to install malware onto a target system, a target computer, a target phone. The malware code can be contained within the dropper in such a way as to avoid detection by virus scanners, uh, um, IPSs, that is, uh, what is an IPS? Um, sorry, I forgot about that. Um, uh, firewalls, or the dropper may download the malware to the target the computer once activated all right next uh, types of malware uh, droppers first of all oh, but uh, wait what is uh, IPS I'm forgetting let's uh, search for it here IPS um, IPS systems. IPS is it? No, it's not. <laughs> Somebody was saying uh, uh, internet service provider. No, that is ISP. Prevention systems. I'm forgetting the word. The first word. Yeah, let's wait for my uh, network connection to be active. Then uh, we shall check that term out. Um, I was talking about uh, types of malware devel uh, malware droppers. Uh, there are two types: persistent dropper. Upon running the malware, it hides itself on the device. It then modifies the Windows system registry keys. Even if the malware is removed, the hidden file will execute upon rebooting the system. This allows it to, to reinstall the malware even if it was previously removed. Alright, let's check that term out. IPS. <laughs> Indianapolis Public Schools. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> that was the first. Okay, what I was talking uh, talking about is uh, intrusion prevention systems. I was forgetting the word intrusion. <laughs> but <laughs> but the first word uh, actually made me laugh. The first link, Indianapolis Public Schools. Damn. All right. Yeah, there is uh, intrusion prevention systems and uh, intrusion detection systems. Yeah, okay, that is the meaning of IPS. All right, uh, so let's go back. Sorry, <laughs> Indianapolis Public Schools. Damn, and uh, my bro told me uh, internet service providers. <laughs> that is ISP. <laughs> All right, uh, types of malware uh, droppers, persistent. Once this, uh, once you run this, it hides in self itself on the device it then modifies the windows uh, system registry keys even if the malware is removed hmm, the file even if the malware is removed the hidden file will execute upon rebooting the system this allows it to reinstall the malware even if it was uh, previously removed all right uh, then non-persistent droppers All right, it's less dangerous because upon uh, executing its payload, it removes itself from the system. Uh, this way, when the malware is removed, it will not be able to reinstall itself. Um, as I've said, to become a competent malware developer, you, first of all, you have to know terms used in cyber security. So these are the terms. First of all, penetration testing, cause. In most cases you want to learn about malware development so that you can utilize the skills to develop your own attack tools during a penetration test 
Penetration testing, also known as pen testing or ethical hacking, is an authorized simulated cyber attack on a computer system performed to, el to evaluate the security of the system. It's unauthorized. You get? Once you're authorized to do it, yeah, it's legal. It's ethical. Once you're not authorized, it's black. All right. Then, what is red teaming? What is a red team? A red team is a group that pretends to be an enemy, comma, attempts a physical or digital intrusion against an organization at the direction of that organization that is also authorized. Then, reports back so that the organization can improve their, their cyber defenses. Um, red teams work for the organization or are hired by the organization. Their work is legal but can surprise some employees who may not know that red teaming is occurring or who may be deceived by the red team then what is incident uh, response still it's a term used in uh, cyber security incident re response sometimes called cyber security incident response refers to an organization process and technologies for detecting and responding to cyber threats uh, security breaches or cyber attacks. The goal of incident response is to prevent cyber attacks before they happen and to minimize the cost and business uh, disruption resulting from any cyber attack that occurs. All right. Next, digital forensics. Digital forensics is a branch of uh, forensic science encompassing the recovery, investigation, examining, and analysis of material found in digital device, often in relation to mobile devices and computer crime, internet, and everything digital. Alright, then what is code obfuscation? Code obfuscation refers to a series of programming techniques designed to disguise elements of an of a program's a code you okay? get it's designed to disguise elements of a pro of a program's code it's the the primary way that a programmer can uh, defend their work against unauthorized access or alternation by hackers or intellectual property property thieves all right those are the terms that we need to know if we are to become competent in cyber security malware development so these are specific to, uh, to the Windows environment here. Uh, I've not told you before, but all the mal uh, this malware series, we are going to be attacking uh, Windows environment, Microsoft environment, you get? So, it's better we know some terms, like two or three. First of all, DLL, that is the dynamic link library, because I told you we are going to do some uh, DLL injection. You get? DLL hijacking, DLL injection, we are going to do a Windows API hooking. So, it's a high time we know about these terms. DLL injection, DLL library, uh, in Linux world, it's a, the shared library, is a piece of code stored as a shared library file, okay? This means that it can be used by different computer programs as and when they need it. That is a DLL for you. Then, Windows API. Windows API informally, Win API is Microsoft core set of application programming interfaces available in the Microsoft operating system. The, the name Windows API collective refers to several different program uh, platform implementations that are often referred to by their own names, for example, Win32 API. Almost all Windows programs interact with Win API. Okay? Um, all right. We are coming closer to beginning uh, coding. So, these are the most useful C, C++, and Windows headers when it comes to malware authoring, malware development. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, this is a C header, that is uh, stdio.h. First of all, we write hash include, then uh, we open the greater and less than signs then we insert std standard input output library dot h std is the header file for the c library that defines the various functions and variables for input and output operations then we have std lib dot h this header defines several 
general purpose functions including dynamic memory management, random number generation, communication with the environment, integer arithmetics, searching, sorting and converting. Then we have unstd.h. In C and C++ programming, unstd is the name of the header file that provides access to POS6 uh, operating system, that is POS Unix operating system uh, API. Okay. Then we have winuser.h, that is a Windows header. Winuser.h is a header file that defines the function and structure for Windows API development. It contains definitions for common Windows API functions such as creative window dialog, enumeration, uh, clipboard uh, format listeners, and others. Then we have Winsock2.h. Wins Windows Socket API, WSA, later shortened as Winsock, is an appropriate application programming interface that defines how Windows network application software should access network services especially TCP slash IP okay it defines a standard interface between a Windows TCP uh, slash IP client application such as an FTP client or a web browser and the underlying TCP IP prot uh, protocol stack then next we have winInet.h still it's a windows header the windows internet winInet application programming interface enables your application to interact with ftp and http protocols to access internet resources as standard as standards evolve this function hand this function handle handle the changes in underlying proto protocols enabling them to maintain consistent behavior then we have windows.h windows.h is a windows specific header file for the for c and uh, c++ programming which contains declaration for all the functions in the windows api all the common macros used by windows programmers and all the data types used by various uh, functions and subsystems they are found in this header windows.h actually um once i drop 20 hours once i'm saying once i drop 20 hours of malware development i will I take a break to teach you about windows programming windows system programming windows driver programming windows kernel programming and c programming yeah those areas are a must have for anybody willing to dive deep into low level security yeah once i drop 20 hours of malware development i'll take a break to go into those areas all right let's go ahead um windows 8 windows x.h this header file redefines many obsolete and out of use function calls among other things uh this header files is uh speeds ports but but fixes no complex uh problems for example in win32 the far and the Pasco keywords are obsolete due to Win32's uh, flat memory model and different function calling procedures. All right, then we have string.h. Uh, it's uh, a C header file and it provides functions for copying, concatenating, compiling, searching, and manipulating C strings and arrays. Then we have C slash start.h. This header files defines the structure of the data returned by the function f f start l start and start such as device ids file serial numbers model link account user id group id and more all right uh, but still it uh, it also provides file type uh, type macros and uh, symbolic name definitions for the model bits and file size fields lastly we have sys slash types dot h uh, this header file defines the types and functions for post 6 that is post unix standard with gnu gnu lib uh, a library for porting c and c++ application to various platforms have you heard all right um these are the headers we're going to be looking at any header that we need to add i'll explain that in detail as we do it okay all right yeah these are the parts of 
any basic malware you get this this is all okay the most needed part in a malware program that's how I, I should say that right yeah the most basic most needed parts in order any program to be called a malware okay be it a rat be it a spyware be it an advanced virus be it a worm be it a botnet it must contain these parts first of all a reverse shell if you don't have a reverse shell in a malware how will you connect back to how will you connect the target and uh, the server so a reverse shell or a connect back shell is a remote shell introduced from the target due to malware activities carried out prior by prior by the attacker you get a reverse shell connects back to the c2c server to the command and control server you get this is what provides us access to the target machine the reverse shell can take advantage of common outbound ports such as port 80 443 888 and others in real in uh, real world cyber attack scenarios a reverse shell can also be open, obtained through social engineering for example a piece of malware installed on a local workstation via a phishing email or a malicious website it might initiate an uh, outgoing connection to a commander command servant provides the hackers with a reverse shell you get and i told you in uh, the future series we are going to look at real world scenarios how with the tools we are developing here we are going to utilize them you get to carry out educational attacks you get on systems that we own don't forget that please this is the end of our slides and right now we are going to drop into uh developing what i told you developing a, a reverse shell developing a c2c server you get and adding only one function that is quitting you get those are actually those are the parts we need in any malware program we need a reverse shell we need a, a, a c2c server then from there that's when we add in advanced functionality like keyloggers like uh, taking screenshots like persistent persistent persistence i don't know uh, like um, what else like uh, uh, browser history taking snapshots uh, changing directory you get what else actually we shall think of of all the features we need to add in the final lectures eh? that will uh, i don't know how many hours we shall use for developing that but it will be massive guys please don't forget to subscribe don't forget to like yeah i'm still going please uh right now i'm going to to end this uh the slideshow so that we can drop in uh in the what in the ide so we can begin de developing right now so i'm going to open uh, uh vs code it's what we are going to use for developing the server and then uh for developing the client that is the back door we shall use a, a windows 8 machine all right so let me close this Uh, let me just save the state because I may need it later. So right now we are um it's kind of freezing. I don't know. Yeah, it's saving the state. At uh, twenty seconds remaining, nineteen. Yeah, guys. Uh, as a uh, I say, as this is close. 10,000 followers in only four months as I said earlier please like the video don't forget to subscribe uh, tell your friend to tell their friends and tell their friends about this channel okay everything about cyber security everything about computer network security IT support all 
things you need to know about malware development, exploit development, reverse engineering. They are going to tell them we have them on this channel. We are going to make videos, drop videos about everything. But this is to taking long to close. Um, all right. As I've said, yeah, this has closed. So I need to open this. This is a. Uh, This is a, a, a virtual machine that I use for development purposes. As I've told you, I've upgraded the system, okay? So right now, everything is cool. But about then, I was a bit suffering because I had uh, a system that was uh, was low on RAM. So I got something new. Yeah, so we're going to be rolling. All right. No, this is not what we need to develop. Um, uh, this is uh, this will be happening in, in once we reach uh, uh, once we reach what once we reach uh, DLL injections. So uh, let's open uh, let's open a new file. It's a C file, and uh, how can we call it? Mm. First of all, I said we are going to develop uh, the backdoor and the server. We are going to develop the server in Linux, but in Linux that is Ubuntu, but we are going to run it on Kali Linux. You get? Yeah. Then uh, why 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 do I say that we are going to uh, develop it in Ubuntu? Uh, all I want is uh, all I want is sorry. All I'm saying is we are developing it in Ubuntu because I mostly use Ubuntu for development, you get? And that's where most of my systems for development are. So, but I've just installed Kali. So I will just put it, I will just uh, share it with uh, Kali so that we can uh, run it there, you get? And uh, I said we are going to develop the back door in uh, Okay, we are going to develop the back door in uh, Windows 8. That is the virtual machine. All right, so let's begin. This is my daughter. Uh, so let's begin the development process. All I need is uh, to open the IDE. Where are you? Yo, guys, what's up? So, yeah. Actually, uh, uh, let's continue. So, as I said, uh, we want to start developing the the program we talked about. So, let's start uh, with uh, the headers. I've written them before so that uh, we can go through them uh, faster. So, the first header is uh, hash include <coughs> std io.h and uh, that one is used for standard input output that is a C and C++ header file. Then we have hash include std uh, lib.h. That one is used for standard utilities. Still, it's a C, C++ header. Then we have hash include on std.h. This one um, provides the uh, system user interface, programming interface for post uh, Unix systems. Then um, we have WinSock. Uh, 2.h this is a Microsoft um, header file and uh, it's used for sockets everything about sockets you check that header then uh, we have windows.h uh, that one is used for making available all uh, the uh, uh, windows uh, API uh, functions yeah that is a uh, windows application programming interface then now uh, we have um, hash include winuser.h that one it's used for windows controls all functions for window controls they are found there then we have wininet.h for internet internet uh, application internet programming interface <coughs> yeah then uh, from there we have windows x.h windows x.h it's used for windows programming interface 
then we have string.h it's a c c++ header it's used for string manipulations cars and uh, arrays then here we have sys uh, slash start.h this uh, one is used for the start function yeah and functional prototypes then we have sys slash types.h mm, that is uh, other functional prototypes so um, <clears throat> the best way to learn about this is uh, to research make a, make some research on google so if you don't understand something here you have to make more research so that you can understand because uh, if I, I explain every detail about every, every header we can take like 10 hours just explaining the headers so let's drop uh, right away into our main function it's going to return an, an integer value yeah and uh, it's an API entry but oh, if uh, we start with this API entry that means we are making available all the Windows application programming interface functions we are making them available into our program then uh, win win main yeah this is the main entry into any Windows program you have to provide the win main and it takes four parameters that is h instance <coughs> small letters h capital i instance yeah and that one is used for making available for providing the windows handle then we have h instance in uh, capital letters h instance mm, h brief that one uh, does nothing right right now it uh, it was used back then in uh, wi windows a 16 bit but right now it's left as a zero then we have lp str small letter l p after letter c m d line uh, this one uh, it's used for um, providing a windows command line arguments then we have int and show s in capital show cmd uh, this one uh, <coughs> helps us to okay it's make it uh, this one int show cmd it it tells our program whether it will be min, uh, the main uh, console window whether it will be main minimized maximized or normal and uh, you will see the parameters it takes then we after that let's provide the handle yeah in some moment um, my laptop has gone off <coughs> yeah so our handle is hwnd stealth yeah that is our handle name then we allocate uh, a console alloc console and it takes no parameters then after that we have we have to provide the find window a function to the to our still handle still close to find window a and it takes two parameters the the class name and the windows name that is console <coughs> window class and our windows name will be no yeah then after that we need this function show is it show window yeah, takes two parameters that is uh, yeah, this comes from this uh, int n show cmd yeah it takes the handle name that is still then it it takes an integer now uh, since we're in our program we need to hide we need to hide the window so it will take a zero yeah then it will take a handle stealth 
handle. Yeah. And then uh, that is the part of the program that we need to do in order to hide our console window. Sorry, my laptop had gone off. <coughs> so, after that, let's uh, create uh, the socket object. Create socket object here. This is our main function. Here we create a handle, create a handle, and allocate console. Let's <coughs> just say creating a handle and uh, hiding <coughs> the console console window. Yeah, so here we are creating a we are creating a socket object. So we call a structure. Structure actual structures uh, they are similar to, to classes in C uh, Python and Java uh, programming languages. But uh, uh, since in uh, C we don't have classes, so we use we use structures. <coughs> Then after that, what do we do? Uh, let's give it a name. Our structure is so addr underscore in. <coughs> that is our structure name. Then the server name is server addr. Yeah, that's that's how we define our structure. So then uh, we have to call a function that contains information about a WinSock uh, dynamic link library. So that that is ws a data let's give it a, a variable that is let's name it the ws data in small yeah as i've said this makes available this contains all the information about uh <coughs> windsock uh, library that is windsock dot uh, dll then after that we have to check for errors in this function you get and uh, to make sure to make sure that the uh, the the version of uh, of windsock that we are utilizing is that one you get so to check let's uh, utilize wsa startup wsa start up and takes two parameters make make word yeah, too. It's checking whether because we are utilizing uh, WinSock 2.0, so it's checking that version, and then it takes the memory address <coughs> of the WSA data. Yeah, so comma the memory address of WSA data, and uh, yeah, it has to be because we are checking whether it has an error equal hmm? if it's not equal sorry not equal to zero that means there is an error so if that means we have to put it in, in a conditional statement and in this case an if statement <coughs> yeah if like that all right if it it doesn't uh, equal to zero, that means there are some errors in the code. So we have to exit with error code one. Yeah, let's just exit out of the system. That means there is an error. So exit. Yep, like that. All right, that is done. 
So let's get out of uh, this if condition. Now let's define the socket object. All right. Uh, defining the socket object. How do we define that? <sighs> let's give it a name. Our socket object, let's give it sock. Yeah. Equals to socket. Yeah, then now we are defining defining the standard API standard sock um, socket object. AF underscore inet. Whenever you see AF underscore inet, that that means we are going to to utilize uh, IP version four. That is IPv4 uh, addressing uh, system. So, because uh, remember that is the most common right now. But remember we have IPv6 <coughs> that is coming. It has already come, but still uh, in its infancy so then sock stream whenever you see sock stream that means we are utilizing tcp ip you get it's a tcp ip protocol yeah then a zero that means we are adding nothing all right whenever you see sock stream that means we are establishing a tcp connection you get all right after that I don't know whether I'm going faster, but I think that is the speed. So from there, we need uh, what do we need to do? Actually, we need to reset some variables here, <coughs> especially uh, our server address, because we don't need uh, any bytes inside it. Okay, so we are going to utilize a, a function and it takes the one, two, three perimeters you get so that we reset um any bytes inside our server server address to zero you get so that that uh, function is called memset yeah it's a window mm, it's yeah it's a windows function memset as i've said takes three perimeters first of all the memory the memory address of that we need to reset server a d d r isn't it yeah then after that we need to reset it what in this case a zero then we need the size of that address okay mm -hmm. sorry uh, our server let me just copy uh, it's valuable from here uh, then i'll say it the size of the server address how do we say that size of yeah size of the server address is it it yeah size of server add hmm. that one is done so we've reset that one to zero then after that let's set uh, the server address parameters all right Set the server 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 a ddr parameters parameters yeah so um, server a ddr uh, dot sin sorry dot sin underscore family yeah, equals to AF underscore INET. That means we are utilizing IP version 4. <coughs> then server, sorry, server ADDR dot scene. So you can see, because we are on a Windows system, as I've said before, we are inside the Windows virtual machine. It's a Windows 8 virtual machine. So, and I've installed div plus plus yeah for for developing our applications yeah. it's just as a it's a just a an a virtual machine still we have a Kali server that we are we are going to use for testing yeah sorry i forgot to show you uh, the final version of this we are trying to develop but you're going to see it yeah so <coughs> let's continue inside our virtual machine yeah Mm, server dot scene underscore a d d r uh, 
s underscore a d d r equals inet underscore a d d r serve ip yeah actually that function um, inet underscore a d d r it's use convert a string a string to to an IP version 4 format, you okay? get because remember we're providing uh, the IP address as a string, just like this. Once you avail it uh, like this, IP equals to then you you open how to put strings 192.168.56. Uh, uh, yeah, that is our server, that is our Kali server. So that means it's a string, you okay? get. So uh, this function is used to convert it to IPv uh, version for format. Then next server addr dot sin underscore uh, port equals to h tones yeah uh, server port yeah actually um, h tones used to convert yeah it's used to convert everything to the network byte order you get once we provide a port number so it, uh, this helps us to convert it to a network byte order so after that we are almost getting to the fancy stuff so right now we need to connect to the server how do we connect uh, let's make a connection making a connection to the server using the connect function all right <coughs> so how do we make a connection to the server yeah all we do is connect connect Take some parameters. First of all, it takes it, it takes the sock, the socket object that is sock. Then it takes the structure of the the sock address. Um, yeah, structure sock. Ideal. That is a pointer to the sock uh, address structure. Okay. Then it takes the server address, uh, the memory address to the server. Object that is ADDR. Mm -hmm. Then after that, it takes the size of the server address. Okay, serve so ADDR. Okay, that is it. But actually, in most cases, most uh, my, most viruses or malware they can try to connect okay the back door may try to connect to the c2c server <coughs> but in most cases if it that if it isn't inside a, a loop a condition you get once it connects and finds nothing like uh, the server you've not uh you okay you went somewhere and the server is closed it will just uh, collapse shut down uh, and leave it but once we we put it in, inside a loop in this case a while loop it will try to connect every often every let's say in this case every after a period of time let me say after 10 hours after 20 hours after five minutes after five seconds after 10 seconds it will try to be on home you get so let's uh, um, uh, provide that functionality so that means we put uh, the this connect function inside the while loop you get while connect Yeah. Sorry. Well, we need one more bracket. Not equal to zero. What do we do? <coughs> you get? Well, connect not equal to zero. That means we sleep. We sleep for how long? In this case, let's sleep for five minutes. Uh, sorry, five seconds. Uh, before we we call home again. Mm -hmm. So after we sleep, how do we call? home again we utilize something that is only in a, I, I think in C and assembly programming that is the go to statement go to 
where should she did go to the start point go to start you get actually go to it's just like it uh, it has a second name it's called unconditional jump you get wherever you wherever you tell it to go in in the code that's where it will go so we've told it to go to the start point so we have to create a start it's not a function it's nothing you get so it has to start here mm -hmm. so let me explain this again we've created a connect function and the connect function takes the socket object that is so then the structure of the socket address point at the structure of the socket address then it takes the memory address of the server then the size of the server itself you get mm -hmm. but it's inside a while loop just to make sure we beacon every often if every after a given time you get because yeah, um, actually the uh, backdoor may try to connect to the server but you are not available you get the server is closed so if we don't put this inside the loop it will just collapse and close you get but once we put it inside the loop it will try to beacon home to call home every often let me say if you provide it 24 hours that's when it will try again but in this case we've uh, provided it uh, five seconds so every five seconds it will try to connect home until it gets a connection okay so we've uh, created this functionality while uh, inside this so uh, if it's not equal to zero okay that means something zero you sleep it sleeps for five seconds after the five seconds it utilizes the go to statement uh, and it goes to the start you get and we've created the starter i don't know how to call it it's not a function the, that's what i think yeah once it goes to start it comes back inside the while loop until it gets a connection all right <clears throat> so after finding after availing that functionality now we need we need a shell we need a reverse shell to connect to the tag to connect to the c2c server so let's uh, create a shell here all right <coughs> so a shell function <sighs> in c it's a, a procedural programming language and that's why i love it that's why i love c actually i don't know maybe i got used to c c programming because it's a bit simple according to me but in most cases okay most guys they claim it's hard but and uh, when it comes to python i don't know why i do python but python is a bit uh, hard for me to read but uh, i try my best to read c i think i'm good yeah <coughs> all right so let's uh, create a uh, the reverse connection this is where all the good shit is going I'm sorry the good thing this is where the good stuff is inside the uh, shell functionality okay so let's create that but before we created our socket object that is soak inside <coughs> the, the main function that means it's a local uh, variable uh, remember if you know C or any programming language we have global and uh, local variables so if it's inside that if it's defined inside that uh, particular program it's a local variable to that function so it can't work outside that function so let's make this a global variable um, just like this <coughs> okay, you just bring it outside it isn't inside any function so int soc like that yeah now it's a global every function that we define here it can utilize uh, soc without any problem yeah and uh, still <coughs> we we need to define uh, our ip addresses but before that actually let's uh, start coding uh, the shell functionality like this so it's going to be a, a void function a void void shell yeah 
all right so uh, let's first of all define uh, three variables i don't know they are variables they are arrays mm -hmm. guys you can tell me so first uh, it's a char a buffer <coughs> yeah let's give it a uh, one megabyte one megabyte is uh, 1024 bytes 1024 bytes yeah mm, those are like those are the bytes it's not a megabyte it's a byte yeah so let's give you that and uh, the buffer will contain all the commands from the server it contains contains all the commands from the server all you can call it anything c to c yeah then uh, the second uh, variable that is container container it will still take 1024 <coughs> and uh, the major purpose of this is to check if the command inside the buffer is greater than 1024 check if command is greater than 1024 yeah, then the third uh, uh, variable i don't know is it a variable is, is it an array i don't know i'm confused you know it's late night this way so i'm already tired from work so guys i'm sorry if i have made a mistake here if i make uh, mistakes no, in uh, this uh, this tutorial just just bear with me because i would love I, I love to produce content but sometimes i come back late home yeah um <coughs> so this one is used to concant concatenate right concatenate yeah if the command inside the uh, inside the above is greater than 1024 get yeah that's its purpose and i forgot to put uh to end this and to end this so we are going to get some errors here <laughs> after that what do we do let's utilize a while because now we are, go we are going to actually define our commands out <coughs> uh, let's use utilize a while statement while do you know that the, it's an infinite loop infinite loop do you know what it means it will loop forever okay oh, there's a moment okay yep it's an infinite loop so that means it will loop forever so let's first of all provide a, a jump unconditional jump whenever it loops from any of the functionality we, we provide in our backdoor it will loop it will uh, jump back to this jump statement you okay? get so First of all, we need to clear all the bytes inside any of these variables here. You get? We need to clear the bytes from here, the bytes from here, and the bytes from here. How do we do that? We utilize a function that is in Unix. Yeah, it's called B0. B0 functionally function. But why? Because I, I, I've said we have a function in window that is memset that i that does the same thing but actually i think we've utilized i need to to provide you with different techniques to do things okay so in in this case we are going to use uh b0 here but first of all we have to define it okay how do we do we define a function yeah so in order to define your own functions all we do is hash define hash define and uh, in our case b0 all right uh, how many parameters does it take it takes some parameters they are two parameters um <coughs> uh, the memory address of the variable we need to actually to flash and the and the number we need to repress with that and i think in this case it will be a zero so p comma 
size okay but remember it's going to get functionality from our mem set function so in this case we define it mem set void okay it doesn't return anything void mem set and it takes three parameters you remember uh, the first parameter as i've said it's the memory address of uh, the variable it it needs to flush in our case then uh, the number we need to you to replace it with in our case zero and then the size of the variable okay mm. we will finish defining our base zero function so let's utilize it here um b0 b0 and the first character you know? b0 b0 <coughs> then the buffer and then the size of the buffer okay oh here okay yeah the size of the buffer size of a buffer that is done then b0 sorry b0 then container comma and size of container and b0 and b0 total total what total response total response 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 <coughs> yeah then size of total response size of total response all right i think i think we're done here so after that that is done we need to receive some commands guys how do we receive commands now tell me let's utilize the receive function rcv that is the receive function yeah so it takes some parameters first of all it takes the so socket object in our case sock then it takes the buffer that is the variable where the command is going to sit and then the size size of the buffer all right that is done then takes one yeah size of the buffer then zero that means we end we ain't adding any commands all right that one is done it's going to receive uh, uh commands from the server yeah we are about to finish with our back door just remaining uh, something little so let's create our first functionality and what well, i love to start with the quit command because in most cases once something goes wrong you, you need to quit you get to quit uh, and close the connection so let's start with quitting because it actually it's a bit a bit simple so why not start with that mm -hmm. uh, quit quit server with which which letter q yeah use the quit command mm -hmm. so all right yeah but now we need to compare you get the string we are valuable in this case we are availing in this case it's q you get we need to compare compare it with the buffer you get if everything is it equals to zero you get that means still we need a condition here and the, the condition we shall utilize a if you get if everything is okay equals to zero that means we shall close the socket and then we call the wsa cleanup function you get yeah so let's call that if string compare you get it takes these parameters first of all the string we need you get and then where the commands are saved in the buffer that is the variable you get and then the size of the string it's one character okay 
equals to zero that means we should close the socket yeah the socket object in our case sock and then we call the wsa cleanup wsa cleanup then we close okay wsa cleanup i don't remember what does it do actually wsa cleanup it's used used to to, to close or to clean up everything about the sockets i don't remember i'll tell you actually but right now i'm a bit tired so just bear with me guys all right let's proceed um if we failed with the quit command we need to run some other commands you get run any other commands so that is our else statement errors um so we call a file descriptor and we need to run it as a process okay the fp will be our file descriptor okay yeah that is the file descriptor of the the buffer right because remember our buffer is that variable that stores the commands from the server of the the buffer all right so how do we define a file descriptor file and this and this that is our file descriptor all right we need to open it as a process f equals to underscore capital p open because i've said we need to open it as a process then it takes some parameters first of all the buffer that is the variable you get and it's going to read you get because it's opening other process we need to read uh, any other commands just like i said before so we put r for reading you get read and execute functionality uh, sorry damn am i getting tired uh, i don't want to get tired now yeah, read and ex execute all right so let's uh, utilize a while loop here all right because we need to con can to con we need if our uh, command is larger than uh, whatever is in the container or in the buffer because remember we called we first of all we ident we created a, a total response variable you get so if anything is greater than what whatever is in the container we need some concatenation you get mm -hmm. so we utilize a while loop maybe give this uh, a comment concant concatenation yeah process when command is greater than 124 okay right so while we utilize f gates because uh, uh what uh, f gates f gates f gates yeah mm -hmm. i've remembered f gates all it does it gets uh <laughs> i'm forgetting f gates function and i don't have any an internet connection now but yeah, f gets a function takes one value um, takes a string from one variable to another variable yeah i think that is it guys if i've made a mistake please i'm sorry but yeah that is it container because it's going to take yeah but first of all it's going to i'm forgetting no, sorry f gates takes three uh, parameters you get first of all the container size of the container yeah and the file descriptor file descriptor that is fp mm -hmm. if they are not equal to 
what to null yeah if it's not equal to null that means when we call uh, another function that is string <laughs> concatenation you get yeah string uh, string cut and uh, we have to concur to concatenate whatever is in the container to whatever is in the total response you get yeah takes two parameters total total what total response i'm getting tired total response comma container because you may avail something uh, a command that is very large so uh, remember the container uh, remember it will go in, into the buffer then the container will check whether it's larger than 1024 and then it will go into the total response you get total response container yeah then if it's larger that means it will need to be concatenated that's what we're trying to do here okay <coughs> All right. Um, this is done, and we send again okay, the socket object that is sock and the total total response. You okay, get still the size of total response. And then yeah that means we don't need any more it doesn't take any more parameters finally we close our file descriptor fp yeah guys all right yeah actually i was a, a bit tired but i had to do this so in the in the last part i think if you've not understood very well i'm going to explain this last part in the next video but for now ciao ciao so le let me see you in the next video all right yeah all right guys so let's look at uh, developing our server right now so let's uh, start by uh, writing the header files and the first one is hash include stdio.h and uh, that one uh, i already told you that it's used for a standard input and output then uh, we have stdlib.h uh, and that one is used use for standard uh, utilities library then um, Number three, uh, we have um, <coughs> a un std h, and uh, it's used for accessing uh, the POS Unix uh, operating system API. And then we have hash include um, that is uh, sys slash types types dot h types dot h. And uh, this one is for other functional prototypes. Then we have hash include <coughs> um, sys slash um, socket dot h. Yeah, as you've heard, socket dot h. It's main socket header. Yeah, used for applying all socket implementations into our program. <coughs> Sorry, it holds all socket implementation implementations that uh, we have to include in our program and then we have hash include uh, next is hash include net inet slash in dot h and it's used for uh, internet address families you get so i said net inet slash in dot h yeah then we have hash include uh, string dot h hash include string dot h and that one is used for string manipulations string manipulations like uh, chars and arrays then we have hash sorry hash include um, arpa slash inet 
port H and it's used for port and socket operations. Yeah, then now uh, <coughs> after this, let's write uh, our main main uh, function. <coughs> yeah, so for, first of all, after writing the main function, it doesn't take a, any perimeter. Then now uh, let's write our sockets. The first one is sock. Yeah, that is our socket but in this case we need two sockets our own socket and the client socket so let's say client socket yeah then uh, after let's um, let's um, supply our uh, variables is it a variable i don't know is it an array a variable let me say a buffer array and uh, that one is useful as i told you in the past uh, to tell you that it's used for storing commands from the server then we have car uh, response response and uh, it has to be of the same size like the one on the on the target uh, on the what is it a black back door sorry yeah it has to be of the same size and I remember it's that size yeah this one is used for storing the response yeah then um, let's now create our structure with struct because uh, I, I think now you understand what I'm doing yeah it's not that much new to you because we've done it uh, in the past so we say socket so ADDR we are we are creating our structure so ADDR underscore n i n then we say server ADDR server underscore uh, address and still um, server address and then the client address right sorry client address that's the problem with auto completion yeah then uh, after that let's create our socket object we've declared the structure now we are creating our creating socket object so how do we create the socket object but uh, before that let's first initialize some um, let's uh, first write out some variables how oh, no, is it initializing okay i've taken long minus looking into c programming but uh, after this after doing this series i'm going to take you in c programming and that will be real C programming from the very basic to an expert level. Yeah. Um, Socklane equals to client. Socklane equals to uh, not equals uh, client lane. Lane. <coughs> Alright. Then, um, hash. We define our socket object now. <coughs> I've already said uh, creating a socket object. Why should I write that again? I think I'm being a fool. Then sock because we are defining our socket. Sock equals to AF INET. We are using uh, that uh, AF INET. That means we are using uh, um, IPv4, IP version 4. Yeah, stream, and that means we are making a tcp connection then uh, zero means we aren't taking any more commands any more perimeters yeah then mm, let's check for errors in our in our socket how do we check let's use a, a condition in this case uh, an if statement yeah, if set uh, set so opt here yeah. mm, then uh, what opt yeah hmm. then we need the structure oh, sorry <laughs> we need the socket and in our case sock okay then we need this sl socket yeah comma s r user and then comma pointing to the memory address of opt 
well, of course, in our case, up to value is one comma, and we need the size of opt. Oh, sorry, we need size of opt val. Yeah, and that's it. That is it. Nothing more. <coughs> Parameters are over. So um, now. Yeah, cause we are checking I, I told you we're checking for the header if it's uh, less than zero get okay? that means we have an error in our code so we should uh, just print uh, print f sorry uh, print f mm, set up and an error yeah you can write anything but i would love to put that <coughs> yeah set up return an error so then after that let's return one then um, after that let's set uh, the server address Setting up of server addresses. All right, then let's start server um, underscore uh, address dot uh, asn dot family equals to f underscore inet uh, ipv ipv4 and then server uh, dot uh, sn underscore addr dot s underscore addr equals to inet underscore addr then uh, let's write the server address here 192.168.56 that is our Kali machine yeah, and uh, after that, let's write the uh, code for the port. Jason, let's go port. Because is it here? H tones. As I, I told you already, that H tones is used for. It's used to convert uh, anything into network bytes. Yeah, the number into network bytes. <coughs> All right. Uh, port 600 6500 that is our port then after that uh because uh, remember in uh, on the so on the server side we don't connect we bind to you get so let's write our binding functionality binding to the socket all right all right then we bind because uh, i've said binding to the socket Sock, you get uh, then uh, the structure structure of the what sock addr is it yeah pointing to is it yeah pointing to the memory address of the server that is it server address then size of server address right I think now you remember no need to explain much because I've already explained most of the like 95 of everything we're doing here I've explained it in uh, while we we're, were coding our backdoor so no need to explain much <laughs> the size of server address <coughs> all right um, then uh, this Let's listen for incoming calls. Listening. Listening. Functionality. Alright, listen. Listen. For what? From what? Ah, listen. The sock. Come on. Then, uh, no, let's give it 10. Oh, 10. Connections 
maximum 10 connections then now uh, let's find the client length is it yeah equals to size of client address is it yeah i think it's that all right so guys please don't forget to subscribe to my channel please 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 um i'm fighting to at least make 1000 followers in four months please 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 i'm kind of requesting subscribe and share and like yeah for more videos please because <coughs> you know um it it takes much to do just one video you know you have to come back from work and then start you do research you get yeah because they are not off my head you know that after doing the research you have to do the recording you have to do the editing you get still you have to do the uploading okay because it's me and my brother you know my bro is young he doesn't know much of this he's just starting out you get yeah so please subscribe to my channel don't forget that please and tell your friend to tell their friend to tell their friends okay that they have to subscribe to the, this channel so that we, you you know whenever you subscribe i get more energy of doing more videos you get yeah this series i think it's going to take like <laughs> 100 videos uh, yeah i think let's see what's in the future all right let's proceed um <coughs> Then, after getting uh, the length of the client socket, let's do like this client address. We are accepting the connection, right? Forget to comment the code. Um, accepting connections. All right. Client address, is it? Yeah, client socket. I think I'm, I'm getting tired. Um, client socket equals to accept. Is it? Yeah, what are we accepting? First of all, the socket. You get? Then, as usual, struct soc soc ADDR. Is it? Pointing to the memory address. So ADDR pointing to the memory address or the client address. Is it? Yeah. Client address comma on the size of. Is it the client length? Yep. <coughs> hey, no, we don't have to put the size of. Because already we know well would we put the if we had to put the size of we would have put the size of the client's address you get but in in this case we already have the uh, size of the client address stored in the client length if we didn't do this like this here we would have done like size of um, client address you get but in this case we've already done that so here we just do comma client length because client length holds the size of the client address you get right that's much um, much of it so here we've accepted connections yeah then um, as usual now we have to do a do infinite wire loop you get that is a true loop um, wire <coughs> one you get yeah then because uh, uh, now we need to apply a functionality you get to our code <coughs> and then and then and in this case we need uh like we did in the back door we need the uh, unconditional jump you get so wherever you are in the code, you just jump back to this point. You get this is the jump. Then now we have to 
because uh, remember we created the buffer and the response and the, you never know they might contain some bytes of data so we need to clear them uh, to avoid any data from in them yeah? so we be zero be zero i told you in uh, windows we have memset memset it's uh, just functionality that is used to clear any um, any data you have in uh, an array or yeah i think in an array or is it even a variable you okay? get yeah it's used to clear data there with the, the uh, a certain integer you give it suppose you want to clear all the data with zero it will remain zero you get and this is the case yeah sorry um as i told you english is just my second language so if i make some mistakes please bear with me and you, you could clarify what i'm saying because and i understand most of this in my language but if i speak my language you won't understand anything and, uh, i think i'm clear all right yeah so <coughs> first of all with b0 in uh, linux no need to predefine b0 because it's uh, there by default yeah so first of all with b0 is uh nini with um, the buffer then size of the buffer you get <coughs> then uh, b0 the response b0 memory address of response size of response all right yeah then after that we need uh, to create a shell feed okay a shell feed it's where we shall enter our commands you okay? get yeah because if we don't create it there is no way of us entering commands uh, sending them to the target you okay? get so let's create a shell field uh, print how can we do it print um, mm, yeah this sign and then shell let's say terminal terminal you get um at terminal at um Hush. I think uh, let's make it like that. Yeah. Let's make ours like that. Then comma. Um, I need. Core this. Then client. Address. Dot scene. Underscore ADDR. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what this does, as I told you already, inet int core is used to convert a string into an address. Yeah, that is it. Then um, after that, we need to get uh, commands and store them in the buffer. How can we do that? F gates, and I've already explained that. F gates, the buffer. First of all, then size of buffer yeah then after that std in we enter you get as i've told you it's used to get the command and saw it in the buffer yeah that is much of it guys um, so next what can we do um <coughs> then we we'll, we need to remove uh, okay you may uh, it may output a, a command with a new line on it so let's remove that new line thing str this is uh, the command we utilize str t this one yeah fortunately we in uh, vs studio and uh, i don't know how they call that is it a predictive algorithm is it a they are predefined i don't know no they are not predefined and i think it's kind of predicting maybe what i want mm -hmm. ah, what am i doing now i don't know <coughs> sorry um, okay new line ha huh. to another problem we have i mean we want to 
and uh, the machine uh, doesn't have that uh, backslash my keyboard doesn't have that backslash thing but here it can do it very well uh, guys if you can help me with that this is my my windows machine and this is ubuntu i'm using a vs in ubuntu try this so all i have to do is i go to my settings and i with the keyboard yeah so that i can get this i got you guys don't worry yeah so here new line oh what is that damn i don't know guys what is happening to me god have mercy yeah it needs to be here all right hey. huh. that uh, new line thing yeah and uh, that uh, this nanny function is in the string manipulation yeah it's used for removing new line characters <coughs> and after that we send command to the target how can we send that we utilize the right functionality is it yeah let's write let's write let's roll let's write guys I'm trying to learn that uh, that learn with that good English, you know. Yeah, first of all, learn socket, mm, buffer. But I think I'm not that bad. You can understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I will improve with time. All right, that is it. Mm, we finished. So let's write one command and uh, just like that in the uh, uh, back door uh, let's write the quit command you get because it's a bit simple and i told you last time i've already explained all the code you get we use we utilize string compare string compare yeah then the uh, string compare takes some parameters first of all the string we need to compare that is q then uh, the buffer where the, the storage you get then the number of characters it's only one color sorry i don't know what's happening to me guys please pray for me so that i can reach a thousand followers in three months that's all i'm requesting please all right <laughs> okay then let's break because you know what we're doing here or else if not this command let's run other commands you get <coughs> else uh, mm, else let's run other commands you get okay let me make a comment, a comment here run Commands. please guys please subscribe subscribe to this channel because you know it takes a lot of work guys it takes a lot of energy a little a lot of effort a lot of research you get so the only payment i can get is for you to subscribe on my channel the more you subscribe that's when that's uh, the more energy i get to create more videos you get yeah please don't forget that um okay um i've written this so what is this this uh it's a receive you get as you've seen it's a receive function hmm? receive um, yeah and then this 
uh, this msg underscore wait all tools are programmed to block the operation until the request is uh, is what is uh, complete as simple as that so we've reached the end of uh, our workshop for the server yeah all we have to do is print the response is it yeah all right guys please i'm requesting go through this any number of times you need and uh, if you don't understand something please just write down in the comment and uh, whatever you need me to improve please the english uh, the accent i don't know whatever you need me to improve just write in the comment you get but please don't forget to give me a like and don't forget to subscribe so after finishing this last time yeah we ended off minus me let's go to our windows machine because i remember there is one part that uh, we forgot to write see yeah we're using this folder back door let's open yeah so forgot to write the ip address and the port number i remember like that let's check and see yeah of course it's here and we didn't write it anywhere yeah so i think uh, let's write it here all right let's see it was ip address and port number all right so um so what uh, uh the uh, server ip what is the value i don't remember what we used but um where is it guys please point for me where it is no 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 it's somewhere here i don't remember i don't really here in the main function we create the socket let me see it so uh -huh, it's, <laughs> i don't know you know i'm sleepy that's that's it i'm f i don't know i'm feeling sleeping i'm no i'm feeling sleepy i think yeah server ip equals to damn what is that damn okay 192.168.56.8 what is it and then uh unsigned short is it yeah short equals to our serve port b what, what have i done Tabs, uh, let me check for the variable here i don't know uh, 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 i love messing up at last so i think then server port Right. Yeah. Equals to six five hundred. Yeah, that is it. So guys, I think everything is cool. Um. So now, let's uh. I don't know. Let's do what. Yeah. What uh, what next is after finishing the code? Let's turn our back door into. Let's make them executable. Yeah, that is it. That is the word I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, let's make them executable first of all. Let's make uh, the server executable. Yeah, let me check the file where it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, no. I'd love to show you. Yeah, oh, they are here because <coughs> this is they are inside my shared folder. This is where I get them from. So let's open them in uh, in a VS Code. Right now, you open your terminal. Yeah, then after opening your terminal. This is what we've brought. Oh, we wrote, is it? Yeah, that is it. So, I, I, I don't remember. Oh, um, the back door. Yeah. So, uh, this is the code for turning the back door into an executable. Yeah, you just, as you can see it that one i686 uh, is it this dash w64 dash m mink m i n g m i n g 32 a dash gcc <coughs> space dash o space backdoor dot e x e space backdoor dot c a space dash lw so 32 space dash lw i n i n t yeah that is it i don't know how i can do this you know how to enlarge this so that you can <coughs> so that you can see everything very well oh, let me write it somewhere so that you can see it Copy this. We put it here. No, 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 no. <coughs> but I think you can see it here. This is the code we read, we wrote, and uh, actually I'm going to put it on my GitHub. <coughs> what is this? Not this one. All right, it's this. Ella before token twenty three twenty three twenty three. Yeah. Let's try again. Yeah. Twenty five. Bugging one on one. Let's do it again. All right, it's been executed. Yeah, no errors at last. So we finished with the back door, and it has an exit file here. So now the server. VCC. Server. Server. Let's see. Eh, cannot find this file server. No search. Let's see. Is it like that? Or is it like this? No search file. Let me look for the code here. Remember having it. Sorry, I forgot to write it somewhere. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> So, 
dua no search file eh ini where is it where has the bug the server gone oh Check <coughs> original code. It's not there. Our development code. <coughs> yeah. Let's see this. Mm, no. I have one here. Yeah, let's open this. Sorry, I know my work is not organized, but just have to bear with me, please. So, let's open a terminal here. Then we say this here. Server. Dash core. Server dot C. Guys, <laughs> are you seeing? Do you know what's happening to me? It's still saying no search file or directory. So, and it's the file is gone, like completely gone. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Hey, it has already gone. What's happening, guys? Could you please explain any of this? Mm. I don't know. Testing examples. Moment, so I'm remaining with only this copy to <coughs> no. why where is it working code oh already I have one but uh, actually I've sh I've showed you how to do everything with this command so as you've seen my files are disappearing so let's test everything out <coughs> so i've already opened uh, the uh, virtual machine and then let me open what we are going to use uh, as our server that is the kali machine here yeah and uh, let's check for the back door is already here on our system so let's run it and see what happens yeah now what it does is what i explained it keeps beaconing this server you get because uh, this happens in real world you, uh, somebody may click on the file and you've not uh, started the server already so what we did with that file let me see. I don't know whether we can uh, go to it earlier. But what is it? Study shared code notes. Um, here, backdoor.c. And uh, what we did here, where? Wire connect. Yeah, this is the functionality that helps us there. Or connect this, this, this. You get it keeps beaconing every after 10 seconds. You get. Yeah, so you don't need to worry that the client has already clicked and you've not done anything. Yeah, yes. Now, first of all, I think I'm going to drop uh, three or four hours right now. That will be part one. Then uh, I drop more, like one hour or forty minutes. You get like that. Um, I'm just waiting for this. This is my research. Um, research search facility yeah then uh, my password mm -mm -mm -mm. yeah don't worry this is just a testing a testing uh, machine testing server and we are going to use these two machines actually I have like six I don't know one two three four five yeah or 
I use them for my different projects. So it's in the shared folder, file system. Let's open terminal here, open as root. Machine. All right. <coughs> you know, I've repeated this this very uh, tutorial a number of times because uh, it wasn't coming like I I wanted it, so I had to do it again. All right. Let's uh, let's open our terminal here. Yep. So guys, please, I'm putting a lot of work here in this server and we have it all right guys this is it we have it so if i said yeah you can see that uh, we have our files on our desktop this is user test 8 and uh, as you can see what is the name of this let's check our system Eight pro thirteen the user the what is the name of the desktop computer name gigi gi. <laughs> no, sorry let's check for the user command prompt but I don't know what's happening to me it's user test eight yeah you can see this is user test eight so we're inside here on the desktop right now and uh, you can see the files here are the same as the files here yeah because remember we have div plus plus we have dll injection rtf we have backdoor.c backdoor.exe we have open short where is open short it's here now we have this week rft this it's here we have C malware what is C malware where is yeah so we are into this system right now guys we've hacked the system you get what I'm saying so please uh, practice 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 okay if you don't understand something yeah you can uh, check me out and send me an email on uh, lhabat95 at gmail.com yeah you can check all my socials um you or you can drop my comment down below i'll answer it as soon as i get it so let's test our command that was q for quit and pff, yeah now guys this is the end of our tutorial see you next time please don't forget to subscribe don't forget to give my like don't forget to share please guys I tell your friend to tell their friends okay Tell them about this channel. I'm dropping new content. I'm dropping everything you ever needed. You get? I'll drop those dope lectures for you. Thanks. And have a good night or a good day, wherever you are. All a good afternoon, all a good evening, all a good morning, wherever you are. Peace.